So I'm being told that uh, we're going to start soon, uh, in a couple of minutes, doing the, the final uh, fix with the uh, Zoom system. Uh, we have a live audience today in DC, the Washington National Press Club, but we also have the online audience. Um, there will be two panels after the opening keynote speech by uh, Maureen Arhausen, partner at BickerBots. Two panels will be at 9.30 DC time on the VC perspective and at 11.30 panel two, the entrepreneur's perspective. Uh, for those of one having the luxury to be in DC, will be a coffee break and lunch at one o'clock. As soon as we fix the uh, uh, Zoom issue, we'll have a welcome remarks by Karen Kerrigan President of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council in Washington, D.C., with, with us here live in Washington. Karen, you'll be online on stage in five minutes as soon as we are uh, clear of the, uh, the Zoom issue. Okay. okay, I'm being told that we are ready to start and to launch this conference. Thank you for all of you being here in Washington and online. Uh, this conference, M&A Regulatory Revamp, is the innovation ecosystem at risk. It, it comes at a good time. Uh, there are a lot of debates uh, in the EU, also in the US, about changing M&A regulations uh, for all uh, industry sectors. Uh, we have decided concurrence together with the Small Business Entrepreneurship Council and Small Business Roundtable and CFAST Law Firm to have this half-day conference on the issue about innovations uh, in the context of these uh, new regulations of the draft bills. Uh, as I was saying just a moment earlier, two panels today after the opening keynote, the VC perspective, panel one, and panel two, the entrepreneurship perspective. I am very pleased uh, to give the floor to Karen Kerrigan, president of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. Karen, the floor is yours. Well, thank you uh, very much. It's, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Welcome, everyone, to our event this morning. M&A regula Regulatory Revamp is the innovation system at risk. Um, thank you, Nicholas, for that introduction. I'd also like to thank Concurrences for their host work and efforts in pulling this event uh, together this morning, along with our partners, SafeBarth and the Small Business Roundtable. A safe Farth, who is our legal partner, offers a full portfolio of advisory, advisory transactional and litigation services across the globe. They have a vibrant M&A practice, and over the past uh, two years, their team has handled more than 200 uh, M&A transactions. And Andrew Sherman, who is a, a partner at Safe Farth, um, who I've known for many, many, many years and worked very closely with. He's going to be moderating uh, the second panel on the entrepreneur's perspective. And you'll want to stay with us for that because, number one, it's going to be a fabulous panel. Uh, and number two, it's always uh, fun to uh, hear and watch Andrew in action. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Small Business Roundtable for their support. Uh, we are a member of the Small Business Roundtable. I actually chair the organization and it is a coalition of leading small business and entrepreneurs organizations dedicated to uh, advancing policy, uh, securing access and promoting inclusion uh, to the benefit of small businesses, businesses that are the heart um, of our economy. And, and finally, a little bit about SBE Council. We are an advocacy, research, and education organization dedicated to protecting small business, promoting entrepreneurship, and for nearly 28 years now, we have worked on a range of policies and private sector initiatives to strengthen the ecosystem for startup activity and strong small business growth. So our work has um, largely been domestic, but we've done a lot of global work as well. Um, obviously, a, a healthy ecosystem that promotes strong startup activity, that incentivizes and enables entrepreneurship investment and innovation entails many elements. And the one that brings us here uh, today uh, regarding the rules of the road for mergers and acquisitions is a very important element of that ecosystem. Uh, quite often in Washington, and I've been doing this for about 28 years now, 
um, along, it would, it, and also it, with government in general, uh, legislation or policies or regulatory actions are proposed without consideration as to their impact on small business or understanding how such proposals could uh, affect the small players, the many uh, entrepreneurs and, and startups who are very dominant, uh, dominant uh, in our economy and across all, across all sectors and markets. And that's really why we are here today, to explore how potential rule changes and actual legislative proposals could upend a system that is actually working quite well um, uh, in incentivizing small businesses and startups to create and develop uh, amazing innovations that are then connected to the scale and the resources that they need, uh, and, in this, and in this case, an acquisition that can bring that innovation to its full potential and to the benefit of many consumers. Um, as we noted uh, in comments that we filed with the FTC and DOJ this past April, along with uh, partners at the App Association, the Developers Alliance, uh, Engine, and TechNet, and I quote, and actually these were comments that um, were filed in response to the DOJ and FTC's request for information on merger enforcement. Quote, the US economy and consumers had benefited tremendously from the creativity of individuals when combined with the resources and institutional knowledge of businesses that acquire their innovations. A merger that helps produce better products or services for consumers is both a natural and beneficial end for some companies and is healthy from a, a competition policy perspective, a fact that existing merger enforcement guidelines reflect. So whether we are talking um, about uh, what the FTC may do to potentially restrict M&A activity um, through uh, costly merger review procedures and other actions, or legislative proposals in Congress, such as the Platform Competition and, Op and, and Opportunity Act, which would reduce incentives to innovate, it is vital that regulators and members of Congress fully understand the consequences, both intended and unintended, um, of these actions. And that's why we are here today to talk about all this. And let me just add that I think we're at a very important time in our economy, obviously. There are many challenges that entrepreneurs and small businesses are currently facing. Uh, you know, but there is some good news. Over the past two years, and ironically during uh, the pandemic, uh, we have seen a surge in new entrepreneurial activity. In fact, in 2021, 5.4 million people filed business applications to start businesses, and that's a 53% increase over 2019. So the transformation in the economy, the disruption, um, has really caused uh, you know, a lot of opportunity, and individuals uh, are seeing that. And we, we just released a survey um, on pandemic startups a couple of months ago, and 13% um, of those uh, startups you know, say their plan is to build a business uh, that they hope will eventually be acquired. So this is, again, th th this is very important activity for our economy, uh, for our competitiveness, for the vibrancy of our economy. And as Congress is considering, you know, competition legislation and, um, you know, how we can com better compete with China uh, and the rest of the globe, obviously preserving, you know, what we have in this country with regard to policy incentives is very important piece for them not to forget. So with that, um, I am honored to introduce um, our next speaker, Maureen Olhausen, who is partner Baker Botts in Washington, DC. She is also a, a former um, uh, Federal Trade Commission uh, commissioner and uh, acting chair as well. And I do have to say, our engagement um, uh, under her leadership was extremely positive. Uh, in terms of her listening to small businesses, giving small business a, uh, a seat at the table, and understanding that what the FTC does and what government does does impact this vital sector of our economy. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Maureen Olhausen, and please welcome her, as I will this morning. So Maureen.
Well, good morning, everyone, uh, here and uh, in the ether. Um, <laughs> delighted to be here. And Karen, thanks so much for that lovely introduction and to Carance for, uh, for, for hosting. Um, as Karen mentioned, there's a lot of different moving pieces right now involving M&A, but I'm going to, uh, in my remarks this morning, focus on what I know best, which is the FTC and DOJ uh, merger guidelines, which are currently under review, both the horizontal and vertical merger guidelines. But what I want to start with, before I get into the details of the agency's recent request for information, or RFI, on possible changes to the guidelines is what is the appropriate use and scope of guidelines for antitrust review of mergers and acquisitions. So historically, these kinds of guidelines were designed to express with clarity the legal principles and analytical tools used by the agencies to evaluate the likelihood that a transaction would violate the statutory prohibition against mergers. And so what is that, right? So it has to have a, um, a probable effect of substantially lessening competition or tending to create a monopoly in defined market. So all of the guidelines should revolve back to that statutory piece because that's where the agencies get their authority. So the objective of such guidelines has been to provide transparency to stakeholders and the public and possibly the courts and business, including small business, which can benefit from where the agencies are and aren't using the analytical tools ratified by case law. And so in this effort, over time, the agencies have relied on established law and where no binding precedent appear, uh, precedents appear on the analytical tools used to embrace new developments in jurisprudential and economic learning. So this has been an iterative and evolving process. But notably, the agencies have adhered to the underlying objective of enhancing consumer welfare and have described analytical approaches that they have been employing for some time uh, as embodied in the preambles to the 1992, 1997, and 2010 horizontal merger guidelines. And the 2010 guidelines in particular address flexibly many of the theories that are raised by the current RFI, including by stating that the agency's analysis takes into account the effect of a transaction on innovation. And innovation is what we're here, I think, to talk about today and to make sure that these changes don't negatively impact innovation. So to the extent that the current agency initiative follows these approaches, so to articulate um, accepted underlying legal principles and to provide transparency for any tools of evaluation, the initiative is really a good idea, uh, as it has been historically done over time. As I said, there, you know, this has been an iterative process. However, I want to put in a note of caution here, the revision of guidelines is not an appropriate vehicle for a promotion of novel legal theories that are untried and would depart from the accepted standard of concern with consumer welfare. Rather than providing clarity, such an approach would create controversy and create confusion among the public and even the courts and the business community, including the investments that underlie a lot of the innovation that we see. So such an effort, if taken, is better left to speeches and policy statements or to be hammered out in the anvil of litigation and not to embed into what's supposed to be guidance purported, uh, that is supposed to reflect the established legal principles and analytical tools. So in my mind, the recent version or the latest versions of the horizontal and vertical merger guidelines already provide a sound and comprehensive framework for the agencies to assess and challenge mergers. And I don't see a need for a major overhaul of that framework. And to the extent that changes to the guidelines are made, I believe those changes should be at most incremental, as they have been over time, and should reflect established antitrust principles rather than novel, untested theories. Because again, the agencies don't create the law Congress creates the law, the courts interpret it, and then the agencies should be applying that law. So in the remainder of my time, I want to discuss a few selected portions of the RFI that are particularly relevant to innovation. 
and I'm going to start with non-price effects. So the agency's strong track record of robust merger investigations and challenges where non-price effects were a principal potential competitive harm belies any concern that the existing guidelines are inadequate to address non-price effects of mergers or that the guidelines have been interpreted unduly narrowly to focus primarily on price effects. We hear that a lot. Oh, mergers, you know, antitrust, it is only focused on price. And that's, that's really not accurate. So a recent agency, so U.S. antitrust agency submission to the OECD on non-price effect in, merger, in mergers details the vigorous U.S. enforcement and court decisions in this area across a variety of industries, including hospitals, physician services, insurance, software, medical devices, and pharmaceuticals, so a very wide swath of the economy. And other recent matters show the current guidelines framework doesn't inhibit the agency's ability to investigate and, where necessary, challenge mergers due to non-price effects. So, for example, the FTC recently voted unanimously, so 5-0, to close an investigation where the principal concern was whether the acquirer would have an incentive to delay or discontinue the development of a pipeline pharmaceutical treatment thus a reduction in innovation, a non-price competitive effect. In this matter, the guidelines framework, so the current framework, was sufficient for the FTC staff to conduct, and this is a quote from the agency, an exhaustive 10-month investigation into various theories of potential competitive harm, including non-price effects. So to the extent the agency's merger enforcement is more common with respect to potential price effects for mergers rather than non-price effects, that is not necessarily undue or inappropriate. In many cases, non-price effects from a merger can be analyzed in terms of price effects by looking at quality-adjusted price. So many apparent price effects investigations may include a non-price effect as well. It's also the case that non-price factors of competition are typically more complicated than price competition. So quality, for example, has many dimensions. Uh, for example, a, a computer consumer will likely care about processing speed and portability and aesthetics uh, and reliability, among other non-price features. Now, even where a merger demonstrably causes changes in a product or service, these multiple dimensions complicate any assessment of whether the effect actually left consumers better or worse off. Now, this complexity with non-price factors may lead the agencies and their staff to focus their resources on price effects where possible. And this choice is perfectly appropriate as a matter of efficient resource allocation. Where non-price effects are hypothesized to be the only effect of an allegedly anti-competitive merger, however, this complexity must be resolved. So thankfully, studies of consumer behavior and preferences provide options for the agencies to demonstrate with evidence the effect on consumers from likely changes in products. Revealingly, many studies choose to express consumer preferences in terms of willingness to pay. And I think that approach is appropriate, even where discussing non-price effects, because it allows a decision maker to compare multiple different predicted effects um, along a single equivalent metric. Now, there are certain non-price effects that are not adequately analyzed by an analogy to price effects, such as a reduction in innovation. And fortunately, the current guidelines already provide a framework for analyzing these and other non-price effects. In particular, and this is a quote from the current guidelines, when the agencies investigate whether a merger may lead to a substantial lessening of non-price competition, they employ an approach analogous to that used to evaluate price competition, end of quote. So in other words, the agencies do not need a special framework to properly analyze non-price effects. The standard framework of the existing guidelines is adequate for that. Now the next topic I want to talk about that's discussed in the RFI is potential competition. And the RFI asks what change in standards or approaches would appropriately strengthen enforcement against mergers that eliminate a potential competitor. However, this question presumes the strengthening of enforcement is necessary, which is contrary to recent agency experience and market evidence. 
The existing guidelines are focused on enforcement with respect to mergers and acquisitions involving actual or potential competitors and provide an analytical framework for mergers between an incumbent and a recent or potential entrant. And this framework considers the market share of the incumbent, the competitive significance of the potential entrant, and the competitive threat posed by the potential entrant relative to others. So thus, the guidelines are already designed to capture potential competition at all stages. And recent agency, or numerous recent agency enforcement actions demonstrate the agencies are already well equipped to evaluate and challenge acquisitions of potential and nascent competitors. So to use an example of when I was the acting chair, in 2018, the FTC challenged a proposed merger in the automotive dealer management system software market between CDK, an established firm with a substantial share, and Automate, a small upstart. And while there was some current competition between the firms, the FTC was also concerned about CDK's proposed acquisition because Automate would c compete even more aggressively against CDK in the future but for the acquisition. And so we did a challenge and the parties abandoned the deal. In 2019, the FTC successfully challenged the proposed merger between Illumina and PacBio, where the, it is alleged that Illumina, the leading provider of DNA sequencing products, attempted to extinguish PacBio as a competitive threat upon discovering that PacBio was on the verge of offering better, more cost-effective DNA sequencing products. And in 2020, the antitrust division brought a successful challenge to Visa's acquisition of Plaid Inc on the grounds that by acquiring Plaid, Visa would eliminate a nascent competitive, nascent competitive threat that would likely result in substantial savings and more innovative online debit services for merchants and consumers. So these, these are just a few recent examples, but they demonstrate that the agencies already use the current guidelines to preserve competition between rivals, including nascent competitors. So any questions uh, the agencies may have about widespread or sy systemic under enforcement is not supported by market evidence. Much of the rhetoric around this issue focuses on the fear that large technology companies will acquire startups not to grow uh, them or improve them or improve their offerings through synergies, but to eliminate them from the market. However, these so-called killer acquisitions are rare and even less likely to occur in the technology industry than in other industries. Additionally, the agency should take care not to adopt an overly skeptical approach that could chill important investments in the sort of innovations that benefit consumers and create dynamic competition among larger or more established firms. Indeed, research shows that a prominent feature of the current startup economy, ecosystem is the frequency with which entrepreneurs purposely develop new technologies targeted at acquisition by established firms for incorporation into incumbent systems and products. And many innovative firms aim to attract buyers in an attempt to gain access to the resources of an incumbent firm and propel development of their products and services. So a recent paper documents how young technology companies are poorly positioned to grow and compete with the entity in acquiring them. In fact, during the period studied, tech founders most often came away from their startups either by shutting down or through an unpro un unprofitable buyout with no gains and were very rarely successful enough to independently transition the company out of the startup phase. By contrast, the remaining market exits for tech founders during the study period occurred through profitable acquisitions. So these study results support the conclusion that the prospect of acquisition strongly incentivized startups to innovate. And the RFI's implicit suggestion that large firms should more often be blocked from acquiring startups is not supported by market evidence over the last two decades. Thus, the agency's current framework for analyzing acquisitions of nascent and potential competitors should remain unchanged and conti continue to look for case-specific evidence that the target poses a unique competitive threat relative to others. And moreover, the agency should be cognizant 
that requiring less evidence that the target is a unique competitive threat would create a more hostile environment for innovation and could create disincentives for VCs to finance startup activity in the first place. But, I mean, it is true that in certain circumstances, as the enforcement, uh, recent enforcement history that I cited shows, an acquisition of a nascent or potential competitor may substantially lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly, as prohibited under the Clayton Act. And there are some factual indicators that can be evaluated in considering the potential for competitive foreclosure in cases involving nascent competitors. So, for example, an important consideration is what the buyer will do with the acquired technology. Will the acquired tech be used to complement the buyer's current technology or become part of its future technology? Also, that's not the only factor. Many acquisitions are done to acquire talent and not technology. So the mere deprecation of certain acquired technology is not by itself indicative of an anti-competitive acquisition. Overall, what they should be considering is if the principal motivation for the deal is to prevent the technology from falling into the hands of a rival who can successfully exploit it and undermine the current large or dominant player, then the transaction should warrant further scrutiny. At the same time, if the acquisition will lead to efficiencies for the large buyer, it should not be condemned absent market foreclosure merely because greater synergies could have been obtained if acquired by another buyer. Now, what are the other topics in the RFI is innovation effects. And there's a broad consensus that innovation is a hallmark of a competitive economy. Because, because competition is often a catalyst for innovation, mergers that enhance market power may quell innovative incentives. And recognizing as much, the 2010 Horizontal Merger Guidelines explicitly address the importance of analyzing the effects of mergers on innovation. So as reflected in the current guidelines, the agencies will assess whether a merger is likely to diminish innovation competition by encouraging the merged firm to curtail its innovative efforts below the level that would prevail in the absence of the merger. And this lessening innovation could take the form of reduced incentive to continue with an existing product development effort or reduced incentive to initiate development of new products. Now, the robust enforcement record of the agencies in the years since the adoption of the 2010 guidelines reflects the sufficiency of the enforcement principles set forth in those guidelines. And as I already noted, the current guidelines favor a pragmatic framework that acknowledges that non-price effects, such as diminished innovation, tend to be non-quantitative in nature. So the guidelines already afford the agency's flexibility to rely on less formal empirical models and more on qualitative evidence to assess the non-price effects of mergers. So again, merger analysis, antitrust analysis, is not straight-jacketed into only looking at price effects. The current guidelines already contemplate this. So to the extent the agencies do plan to introduce modifications, the revised guidelines should preserve a flexible analytical framework that allows a fact-specific case-by-case assessment in lieu of broad presumptions that could inadvert inadvertently harm innovation. Now another topic in the RFI is market definition. And it is true that market reality should drive the antitrust analysis, not merely market definition. And the 2010 merger guidelines took care to convey expressly that effective merger analysis should not start and end with market definition. However, it is a necessary step in any merger assessment, including those involving innovation and intellectual property. And courts have consistently held that determination of a relevant product market and geographic market is a necessary predicate to establishing a Section 7 claim because of the statute's requirement that a substantial lessening of competition be shown in any line of commerce in any section of the country. So again, these obligations on the agencies all go back to the statute as Congress enacted it. 
So attempts by enforcers to evade the required, required market definition have been met in the courts with judicial rebuke as a contravention of the statute itself. Now the RFI suggests that market definition may not be feasible or may not adequately capture broader concerns about incentives to innovate, given that innovation may involve the creation of a new product or service categories. So while the competitive assessment of potential innovation harms may not be as straightforward as assessing merging parties' current products or service overlaps, market parameters can still be established by evaluating the characteristics of the products or services for which a lessening of competition may occur. So one last thing that I want to touch on is to be sure as the agencies evaluate what the merger guidelines, what changes may be appropriate, that they recognize the innovation enhancing effects of mergers. So while mergers can diminish innovation, they can also serve as crucial catalysts for innovation. And the existing guidelines reflect this reality, acknowledging that mergers may generate cognizable research and development efficiencies, thereby strengthening the merging firm's incentives and ability to conduct research or development more, or, uh, uh, development more effectively. And the framework for the competitive effects analysis should not overlook the benefits that may and often do arise from the merger of competing firms, including improved economies of scale, broader availability and superior offerings from combining complementary capabilities, and faster time to market. So I think there is this narrative going on that mergers are anti-innovation, that mergers are generally are negative for the economy, and I don't think the evidence bears that out. Um, and so the guidelines should not overlook the potential synergies brought about by innovation mergers, nor should they overlook the detrimental impact that unnecessarily stringent enforcement is likely to have on entry into innovative markets. In particular, there's a risk that an overly broad prescription of mergers involving nascent competitors may discourage the very startup activity that regulators seek to protect. And startups rely heavily on venture capital funds, and the return on investment for most venture capitalists is generated from the eventual sale of the startup to a more established firm with the ability to bring the invention to market at an accelerated pace or on a larger scale. So to protect the startup culture that has been so essential to fueling innovation and economic growth, the agencies should avoid creating a climate that is presumptively hostile to the acquisition of nascent competitors. And currently in merger analysis, the agencies focus, often focus on short-term price effects over long-term innovation benefits. But innovation is indisputably vital to economic growth and welfare, and the powerful lever that in the long run expands output and brings down prices. And I hope whatever revisions we see to the guidelines recognize the importance of that innovative cycle, and I hope any revisions to the guidelines uh, are able to allow it to continue. So thank you for having me. I'm happy to take um, any questions um, if anyone has any. Mr. Sokol. Uh, Maureen, great speech. So one thing, as, as you work through some of the difficulties of guidelines that don't actually do like the microphone, I can speak loudly. I'll, I'll get this. Oh, okay. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. It's very rare that I'm told that I'm not loud enough. <laughs> um, so one question I have for you is, you're at the front lines and see things that we can't really test empirically, the most important of which is, how do you advise clients through a period of significant regulatory uncertainty? What is the chilling effect of having either A, unclear guidance because it seems to vary deal to deal, 
uh, without the kind of traditional uh, predictability that merger guidelines that get followed by agency staff would normally have? And then what is the chilling effect of this, of, of things that literally never even come to fruition because the risk is, is too high? Could, could you speak uh, to your uh, personal experience on, on this? Yes, certainly happy to. It, it's a very challenging time to counsel clients who are considering uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, a lot of the review is happening as normal. It goes forward. Certainly, there are much we have to predict and build into the process much longer timelines for antitrust review, which may have a negative effect uh, on you know kind of squelch some deals that are totally unrelated to any competitive issues. But can uh, you know can the parties put up with an 18 month uh, uncertainty period? Is that something that they can um, that they can live with? Um, so that that's one part of it. One of the other things that's just highly unpredictable, and I have seen some deals that were sort of on the bubble. Um, they didn't really raise any competitive issues, but the company said, uh, we just can't kind of put our executives through that, put you know, everything sort of into this limbo for, for, that, for that period. I think for deals that have very, very strong efficiencies, that are, you know, have you know, very you know, good story, um, we will eventually see those get litigated in court um, because if the agencies try to overstep what the precedent allows them to do, because guidelines are not laws. Guidelines are merely um, a description of how the agencies should evaluate deals. Um, but you know, do companies have the appetite to see it all the way through and then to, to actually litigate it? So I do think we are seeing a chilling effect um, though, obviously, a, lo a lot of deals are continuing forward because of the strong um, foundational factors that make them, a, a, you know, a pro-competitive outcome. I, I have a, a quick question, um, Maureen, and, um, you know, I, SBE Council and a lot of the uh, small business and entrepreneur groups that we work with, um, we have members uh, and you know partners that have a stake in this debate. Um, a lot of uh, startups, the startup ecosystem, and entrepreneurs are concerned about what may be happening. And you know, given your time at the FTC, I was wondering how best that we can, how best can entrepreneurs and startups, and you know, sort of the groups representing small businesses, best influence this debate. I mean, what are what are what are sort of the points, I guess, or um, you know. How do we need to communicate and engage? I mean, we're doing what we can, but any other tips would be <laughs> very helpful, um, uh, at being on the inside as you were. No, uh, so I think, you know, the, you, the engagement thus far has been, you know, a, an excellent idea and just continue to do it perhaps, um, you know, through, through any channel, congressional channels, um, input to, to the agency because, the, the narrative that you know, a big company buying a small company is always a bad thing, a killer acquisition, you know, and not really understanding this beneficial ecosystem of you know, kind of uh, distributed innovation that then gets fostered by investment with the payoff being that feeds into you know, a bigger, you know, the ability to kind of enter on a bigger scale and or more resources that a big company can provide. Um, I think that the officials who are doing this you know, generally, genuinely are interested in trying to preserve a dynamic economy. Um, so I think you know, continuing to engage with them to give you know, more light into how this ecosystem actually works would really be helpful. Um, you know, the killer acquisitions narrative really came out of a paper um, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and there were particular aspects of the pharmaceutical industry where that might make sense because of the pipeline, the long FDA pipeline, and how you're able to say, well, you know, this is going to be a, you know, a therapeutic substitute for that. Whereas for, for lots of innovations, that, that isn't the case, or you don't know where the next innovation is, com is coming from, and there's a lot of little pieces that maybe have to fit together. So I think telling the fuller picture 
to um, uh, you know to policymakers just c continue to do it right because it was a, it's a catchy term killer acquisitions um, but it's it's not I think um, based on evidence across the wider economy. Well, thank you so much, Maureen, for spending. I uh, your time with us this morning and just offering your wisdom. And um, please join me in thanking Maureen. And, um, you. you know, gosh, we'll, 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 we'll be contacting you again in the future <laughs> just to great. tap your wonderful <laughs> brain and experience. Thank you so great. much. Th thank you. Okay. So, um, well, next up, we do have a, a, a killer panel, and this is a good thing. <laughs> If I can uh, uh, ask that our panelists uh, join us for uh, the VC's perspective. And also wanted to see if our, our moderator, who will be joining us online, is, uh, is with us right now. Ray, are you there? OK, Ray, okay, is, coming. Ray is coming. Ray is joining us. Um, as our as our uh, our as our panel uh, gets prepared, um, also I'd, I'd like to remind our our audience. We have a big online audience today. That if you are uh, tweeting, um, please use the hashtag Innovation Economy. We'd love to uh, you know get some engagement uh, on social media and hear what you're thinking and what you're saying. And um, um, particularly as we move into the panel discussions. And please feel free, again, there is the opportunity to ask questions and to engage online. And please feel free to do that. So, and I, I see Ray Keating, our chief economist at the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council has joined us uh, via, via online uh, capabilities. Thank goodness we've had that. So Ray, I'm gonna turn it over to you where you're gonna be introducing our panel, correct? Can hear me and fine and all. Whoops, we're Whoops, working on the working audio. On the audio. Yep. All right, right. All right, right. All right, right. Try now. Try now. Try now. How about now? Are we good? Everything good? Yes. 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 I'm getting some feedback here, but I'm assuming you guys can hear me. Um. So welcome all. Uh, as Karen mentioned, I'm chief economist with the uh, SBE Council. Um, in terms of a little uh, background, I was a weekly newspaper columnist for 20 plus years. I also taught MBA students for 10 years, largely about entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and I've written a few books along the way. And the latest is called The Weekly Economist, 52 Quick Reads to Help You Think Like an Economist, something that I need to distribute more in Washington, DC, I think. Um, Anyway, I will uh, do some very brief kind of set the table uh, introductory remarks, then I will introduce each of our speakers and then hand it off to them. Um, in terms of this, this entire effort, you know, why is SBE Council involved? Well, the U.S. economy is very much a small business economy. When you look at the data, look at the numbers, 89% of employer firms have less than 20 employees. You throw in non-employer firms, and we're talking about 98% of uh, U.S. businesses having fewer than 20 employees. Put it in another, give another perspective. Latest tally gives us more than 32 million U.S. businesses, and only about 20,000, a little over 20,000, have more than 500 employees. Um, uh, uh, also, in also, terms of... Uh, uh, some of the concerns that we've had, I've had some concerns about entrepreneurship lagging since 2006. That's not about corporate power, which we hear a lot about uh, in this discussion. There are a whole host of reasons for that. You can look at tax policy, you can look at regulatory burdens, you can look at demographics, a whole host of things come into play there. Um, but there is, Karen mentioned in her opening remarks, there's some reason for encouragement, for hope. Um, there's been a big jump in new business applications over the last two years during the pandemic, uh, which surprised a lot of us, but it's very encouraging. Um, jumped from 3.5 million in 2019 to 4.4 million in 2020, and then 5.4 million in 2021. There's also been a move up recently in some self-employment numbers. So those are, we're not where we should be on that by any means, but moving in the right direction. 
Um, and obviously funding is critical to entrepreneurs across the board. And that's why we're talking about, we have this panel about venture capital. Um, I won't steal, I know Jeff might touch on this, but VC numbers have looked, uh, have seen big jumps uh, in 2020 and 2021. Um, and obviously mergers and acquisitions, acquisitions are a key option for entrepreneurs, you know, many people have said that there are three options as you're growing your business, uh, as you're moving ahead in your business, either failing, going public, or being acquired. Um, and going public is very costly. Uh, so acquisitions are big for a lot of businesses. Karen mentioned that just in our survey of what I call pandemic businesses, businesses that were started, small businesses started during the pandemic, 13% uh, of respondees said that they would eventually like to sell their business. And I know there was a, a study um, released by Silicon Valley Bank back in 2020 that said 58% of startups expect to be acquired. So this is why we're here. Also, one final point I'll make is uh, I like to bring things back. To, I'm an economics 101 guy. Um, so I do like to provide some reminders, especially when I get into the policy debates in Washington. You know, a reminder maybe on what exactly a monopoly is, monopoly power, market power. You know, we hear that term thrown around a lot, monopolistic big tech firms, um, you know, obviously targeted now are companies like Amazon and Apple and, and Meta, Facebook and Alphabet, Google, and, and I guess Microsoft gets thrown in there once in a while. But, you know, just a quick economics 101 reminder, um, monopolies exist, you know, in terms of economics, uh, when there's only one seller um, and there's, there are no close substitutes for the product and high barriers to entry exist. So, you know, in order to be a monopoly, a firm has to control the entire market technically from an economic standpoint. Uh, there can be nothing close to the good or service provided and potential competitors must be eliminated due to high barriers to entry. So when we look at the markets we're talking about, uh, dynamic, fast-paced, innovation-rich, is that really the case? And also, you know, how do true monopolies, um, how do they function? What, are, what do they do when they're uh, operating in the marketplace? Well, they tend to reduce supply, they tend to increase prices, um, and they tend to diminish innovation and quality. And I, again, the question has to be asked, are any of these, for example, these large tech firms that we, a lot of people have been talking about uh, behaving this way? So I bring up my Economics 101 questions uh, for you all to ponder. Now, let me introduce our presenter and our discussants. Um, I'll, introduce, I'll do the three introductions, and then I'll turn it over to Danny. Uh, Daniel Sokol uh, is with White and Case. He's uh, a professor of law at the USC Gould School of Law. And by the way, if I leave anything out of your introductions, when you have the mic, when you have the floor, please, uh, please fix that. Um, Danny focuses his teaching on uh, and scholarship on complex business issues from the early stage startups to large companies. He covers issues like antitrust, corporate governance, compliance, innovation, M&A, uh, technological transfer, transformation, and global business regulation. He's a member of the American Law Institute. He also serves as academic advisor to the United States Chamber of Commerce and as a non-governmental advisor to the International Competition Network. Uh, one of our discussants, Kelly Kemp, um, is a senior count, the senior counsel at Uber since 2019. She advises on antitrust and competition law matters, including mergers and acquisitions, litigation, compliance, advocacy, advocacy and policy. And policy. Um, prior, and prior, she was an associate attorney, attorney at Wilson Socini. Goodrich and Rosati. I don't know if I butchered that or not. If I did, I apologize. Um, and she dealt with antitrust matters, including counseling on M&A, litigation, and compliance. And finally, Jeff Farah is the general counsel for the National Venture Capital Association. Um, he advocates before Congress, the White House, agencies for pro-entrepreneurship policy, policies and leads in-house legal matters for the association. Um, it says here, Jeff loves working at the intersection of venture, public policy, and the law. He serves as, concurrently serves as treasurer of Venture PAC, the political action committee of the NVCA. And provide, prior, Jeff was counsel to the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, where he advised Chairman John Thune 
and members of the Committee on Technology, Telecommunications, and Internet Policy. Thank you so much to each of you for being here, and I will turn it over to our main presenter, Danny. Thank you. And we're going to have some slides, and they're going to magically appear on screen moment. There we go. And I don't have a clicker, so I'll just give you the little nod. Um, so a few things. First, uh, I'm a professor, a uh, tenure professor, uh, technically I have a chairholder at uh, USC Gould School of Law, but I have a secondary appointment in the Marshall School of Business, and there I teach a digital regulation class and this coming spring a digital transformation class. So th these issues are very near and dear to my heart from an academic perspective. Uh, but I also do some practice, as uh, Leah mentioned, so just a few disclosures. Number one, uh, I've done pure academic work in this area, but I've also done uh, work including for, for Jeff at the National Venture Capital Association. I've done work in this area both for industry associations and for companies both companies that are big tech and I'd also say companies that are tech in, and sort of when they talk to their shareholders fantasize about being part of big tech. Um, when they talk to members of Congress, probably they don't share that fantasy. Uh, but uh, so, so I do some of that uh, work as well. So I'm gonna just give you an overview of how do we view this from the venture capital perspective because one of the things that I do is I teach uh, class in law and entrepreneurship. We're gonna go to the next slide. So, I always find that the best thing to do uh, is to motivate a talk, is to actually work you through what are the big takeaways. So first, I'm gonna give you some very basic idea of how venture capital and corporate venture capital works. And the reason why I mention corporate venture capital is oftentimes this gets lost in the discussion, but this is also an important driver uh, for acquisitions, and it really matters for small businesses that are looking to exit. Next, um, I'm gonna explain why venture capitalists and corporate venture capitalists, right, they, they need an exit. And then I'm going to really work through how most exits happen via acquisition. So we still have a fancy, every entrepreneur has the fantasy that you're going to exit via IPO. That's not how it happens in the vast majority of exits in the United States. Um, finally, we're going to work through the application of how this impacts antitrust, all, all of this motivation of what, of what it is that drives uh, venture capitalists and corporate venture capitalists to invest how this impacts the rules, many of which Maureen Olhausen brilliantly covered in her keynote. We're gonna to go to the next slide. So background, we define, you know, what is venture capital? So congratulations, I, you know, many of you probably have investments in a fund that is itself investing in venture capital. So these are venture capital funds are basically funds that exist for a finite period of time, which means at, at the end of the fund, they have to disburse um, you know, their investments back to the people that gave them money. So that includes pension plans, uh, that includes uh, all kinds of mutual funds, it includes uh, university endowments, and you know, if you're so lucky, uh, private offices of very wealthy families. So again, we all aspire to that. Um, and it turns out venture capitalists have tremendous opportunities. They have a portfolio of companies. So in many ways, it's like private equity, except it's not private equity because there's a lot more risk involved here. Um, and I give you some examples of very significant exits in venture capital because in venture capital, with the higher level of risk, you get higher levels of return. I give you two famous examples. One is the investment that Sequoia made in uh, WhatsApp that got acquired by Facebook. So, you know, what's an amazing exit? You invest $60 million for some $5 million. That, that's great. 
uh, normally the way it works is you have a fund, uh, and then uh, similar, so this goes to show that it's not just, uh, you know, our vision of tech is very narrow. It's not just software, it's hardware, it's biotech. Um, and there are so many parts of the economy for which this really matters. And basically, the way venture capital works is, again, you have your portfolio of companies. You have a certain finite period of time. And most of your investments, you get zero return on investment, right? Your, your median investment is zero in return on investment. So you're waiting and hoping that one of your companies is going to have a massive return. That's what you're hoping for, something that is really transformational. You're also really thrilled, particularly as you get towards the end of the life cycle of the venture capital fund, um, to get a really strong return investment, let's say 3x, right? Um, venture, corporate venture capital is a little bit different uh, in that it is an existing company that has its own venture capital arm. This goes back literally decades ago GM was one of the very first companies that did this uh, in sort of modern times, starting in the 90s. I think Intel was probably the most important of the corporate venture capital. But so many large firms have their own corporate venture capital arm. I give some invest, uh, examples. So Google made an early stage investment in Uber. Um, and it turns out Microsoft made an early stage investment in Facebook. Both those paid off really well. But there are so many other examples um, that we have. So again, if we're focusing on other corporate venture capital, we'll, we'll give you some examples of the kind of acquisitions that of corporate venture capital, what they think of. So for example, Qualcomm, again, hardware company, invested in Waze software technology. Um, great exit. Next slide. So, as I suggested, you don't sort of, this is not a bank. You're not accumulating money for the sake of accumulating money. If you're a venture capitalist, you have to pay out your investors. If you're a corporate venture capitalist, ultimately, uh, one of two things. Either you're set up in such a way that it mirrors that of venture capital, uh, where you have a fund for a certain uh, number of years and you have to pay back the, the parent corporation. This is how Intel is structured. In some cases, there is a finite, uh, time, but, but sometimes you could hold a little bit longer. Uh, but ultimately, what motivates VCs and CVCs? Exit. You don't hold for the long, a long term. You are looking to cash out. And if you do not have the ability to cash out, you do not make money. And that's a problem if you then limit the opportunities. So why are there fewer opportunities outside of M&A? So this is really important. Why is it that we're focusing on M&A? Because since the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, we simply have fewer M uh, you know, IPOs. Why? The compliance costs of Sarbanes-Oxley are significant. So this explains some number of IPOs that we simply don't see anymore. IPOs tend to be much, much larger. But the other reasons we don't see it, number one, uh, Reg FD. We also have direct listings. Actually, interestingly enough, the first direct listing, I don't know if anyone knows, was Ben & Jerry's uh, long ago. Yes, when it was still an independent company of like two hippies in Vermont. Um, then, you know, the rise, and one might even say the fall, of SPACs. Um, so it, look how quickly that changes. And also, it's all about timing of the sale, right? You reach a certain point when you're the venture capitalist and you know that your fund is closing, you need to sell, let's say within the next year or two. And if the IPO market is not feasible, it's mergers. And this is what drives so much opportunity because what is it that VCs are looking for? Return on investment. By the way, what is it that the entrepreneurs are looking for, they want to cash out too. They want money. They've been living in their mom and dad's basement for years, and damn it, they want to have their own place. Um, so if the entire ecosystem, as I've set it up here, is unbalanced, it's unbalanced towards M&A. So I want to focus on what that means. Next slide. 
So let me explain what is the value creation aspect. So one of them is complementary assets. What is it that VCs think about or CVCs think about when they're making an investment? Most businesses are not going to massively scale up on their own. You need to have complements. So what is a complement? The best way I can describe it, and I'll give you one example because I happen to have uh, someone on the panel, so I focus on things that you know, might be relevant. So imagine in the evening, you'd like some tacos because tacos are delicious, right? There's fat, there's salt, there's protein, everything that's delicious in this world. And I say this as someone whose primary job is a professor, right? I understand what students want. Fat, salt, you know, there's even some carb slash sugar in, 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 the, in the corn tortilla as well. Um, but you know what goes really, really well with tacos? Beer. So let's imagine you're Uber, and you'd like to have both tacos and beer when people order from you. So the problem is in the United States, we have a bizarre three-tier distribution system that goes back to prohibition. So all kinds of vertical restraints. It's very, very difficult to build up you know, a uh, beer delivery business. It takes time, because you need to get a bunch of regulatory approvals. You need to get all kinds of regulatory approvals. So what do you do? You say, I want beer, I want tacos, I want them together, I'm gonna acquire Drizzly. Brilliant acquisition. We can understand the compliment, beer, tacos. But we can play this in other similar ways. So I'm going to give you two examples, uh, both in biotech and in hardware, to show you that it's not just you know, digital consumer-facing platforms. So number one example I give you is Intel. It recently made an acquisition of an Israeli company, so Intel Hardware. But this company that they acquired, they acquired why? Because it gave them a software AI tool to basically better integrate hardware and software. Same kind of thing, beer, tacos, hardware, software. We'll probably stick to beer and tacos. But let me give you just one more example, and that's in medical technology, Medtronic. Lovely biotech firm, devices. What do they do? They buy a company that helps with behavioral tracking because increasingly, medicine is smart medicine, and you want to know how things are working. So again, integration of hardware and software, it's just in a medical context, right? So it's difficult for some of these smaller companies to fully scale up. They'll never be the next Medtronic. But they're a really great piece that if you can integrate these two things together, you're unlocking a lot of value that's going to help consumers and society as a whole. Again, beer and tacos, I think, help society as a whole. Next slide. So there are other things that really matter to the ecosystem. What does m and do? Number one, you get better pricing. So why do I love it? Um, that we have acquisitions by publicly traded companies. So I want you to think to a different app. It's called Zillow, right? You know what really helps you get a sense of your home value? Comparable sales. So the one beautiful thing that we have when we have large publicly traded companies acquiring smaller businesses and giving those opportunities is we have a better set of pricing for additional rounds of venture capital investment. It makes the entire financial system more efficient. The other thing that I note, and this is much more on the DEI side, is that many funds that have been started in recent years have much more of a DEI mission. We have many more funds uh, where the VCs are diverse groups. So if you change the rules now, there is going to be a disproportionate income on women VCs, on minority VCs. So if you change the rules now, when we think of unintended consequences, you are going to hurt the VCs who are investing, not just the VCs themselves, but the investments they make, oftentimes, we see empirically, tend to be more diverse groups that hadn't gotten the investments before. Next slide. So then the big question is, 
What does antitrust have to do with this? Haven't you just been talking about entrepreneurship up until now? Yes, but it's the application that matters. So number one, there's always the possibility that a particular merger may create some kind of anti-competitive effect. So antitrust has a role to play in mergers, of course. But if you change the rules, the, the, you, know, you say like, oh my god, you know, these mergers are bad. Everything is a killer acquisition. Well, if everything is a killer acquisition, if everything is a nascent competitor, guess what? You can't basically have a merger system that works, and you've now shut off the entire merger system. So, you know, it turns out, what's the better way of doing it? In many ways, the way that the agencies have been doing it. So you actually have to apply the theories to your specific facts. The second thing is, if you say antitrust tools are not really applicable um, because you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty, then why have a merger control system in the first place? So that can't be the right answer. What I will also say is you actually have to have the right tools at agencies. So I can't tell you as of today, but as of perhaps a month or two ago, it turns out that the same Federal Trade Commission that uh, had a study on startup acquisitions said, we need more data. We need to understand this ecosystem. You know what they don't have? A subscription to PitchBook. I want to make sure that this is as jarring to you as it was the first time I heard it. If you say that you really want to understand the venture ecosystem, and you literally do not have the subscription, because I asked my librarian at USC's Marshall School of Business, $10,000. Um, if you do not have a subscription that actually provides you data of that venture capital ecosystem, it's kind of incredulous to say that you're going to monitor this, you know, this entire ecosystem to look for harm when you don't understand the ecosystem. This is horrifically bad. Um, so what could we do that would be better? So it turns out you know, we do the careful case analysis. So the best way I can answer is, what should we not do to make it worse? Number one, blanket bans. So we've gotten proposed legislation that just bans acquisitions if you're too large a company. Could they explain why they sort of create a threshold at a certain level for too large a company? Not really. We don't get that. Um, there's no economic basis for that. Um, it's not linked to particular deal-specific harm, so blanket bans, bad idea. Next, right, overly harsh restrictions, right? How about, well, we don't just ban everybody, we'll just ban tech companies. So the first question is, what is tech at this point? Because just about every company across the supply chain is going through digital transformation. Uh, so what's tech versus non-tech? It's not so clear anymore. Um, but if it's just companies that do a lot of acquisitions, well, that, that's the business model. So we're now going to regulate based on certain business models. But could you explain why certain business models are better than others in this respect, specifically the competition? Again, not clear. But this is some of the potential negative effects of this legislation, some of the proposals, I should say. Um, then, uh, what is the implication? So if you can't grow via acquisition, what's the alternative? You basically create a walled garden of innovation. You are making all that innovation internally, and you're basically shutting out everybody else. Is, is that what you prefer? Hmm. That would sort of be at odds with some of the other proposed legislation. Again, undetended consequences, because they may not have thought this through. Final point, right? You actually need antitrust to understand this ecosystem. A, it's hard if you don't actually subscribe to PitchBook. B, it means you actually have to engage actively with the users of this system to really understand venture-backed companies, to really understand. So this is why uh, small businesses really, really matter. But you also have to talk on a regular basis to entrepreneurs and beyond the entrepreneurs to the venture capitalists and the corporate venture capitalists that are really funding this innovation to understand the motivations. For them, the motivation is not like, I want to create antitrust risk. The motivation is, I want to make money. 
and trying to understand when making money creates antitrust risk, that's the hard part. But if you don't understand the ecosystem, you're not asking the right questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you. All right, Danny, thank you so much. Once you mentioned beer and tacos, you had me. Um, what I'd like to do now is to go to our discussants. Um, maybe we'll start with Kelly for her remarks and if she has any specific responses and additions to Danny and then, and then to Jeff. So Kelly, please. Great, thanks, Ray. I don't know about you guys, but I am feeling awfully hungry <laughs> after all that beer and taco talk. Um, I mean, Danny, so actually taking a step back, um, as Ray said, I'm Kelly Kemp. I am in-house antitrust counsel at Uber. So I do antitrust all day, every day. Um, what Danny said is exactly right. Um, what antitrust practitioners, enforcers need to understand is the VC ecosystem, is the system that finances and encourages innovation and growth, you know, the backbone of the American economy, as Ray mentioned. Um, I think what all of us, you know, in this room and uh, in the ether need to, or could take heart from, is that the regulators do have the same objective, right? Their goal is also to spur innovation and economic growth. You know, the big question of the day is, how do we do that? So we all know this, we've got kind of two different camps one camp, the one that supports you know, these congressional bills that are quite dramatic, um, that support uh, an increase in enforcement, they think existing antitrust laws have been unsuccessful at preserving uh, economic growth in the American economy. You know, they've led to increased concentration across markets, across industries, um, you know, an increased number of monopolies. So they believe that we need stricter regulations and laws um, in order to break up uh, what they're seeing as all of this stagnation. Then of course, on the other side, we have the critics of these bills and this growth, uh, <laughs> the critics of these bills and increased enforcement um, saying, no, you know, the antitrust laws as they exist have contributed to the, the amazing growth that we've seen over the last several decades. Um, so that's really the disagreement that's at the heart of the antitrust debate today. But we all, you know, for the most part, we ha agree on the objective, right? We all want more innovation. Um, so that's why I think discussions like this are so important. Um, it helps bring together, uh, you know, enforcers, practitioners, market participants, the financers of our market participants coming together to talk about look, guys, we all want to do the same thing, but we need to have the information that we need to make sure that we're doing it in the right way. So, you know, Maureen talked about this, um, Danny talked about this. We need to make sure that we're not over-indexing, over-enforcing in a way that has unintended consequences on financing, on, you know, our very complex Markets, markets are getting increasingly complex, I would say. Um, we're seeing uh, technology reshaping industries in a way that we might not have foreseen 20, 30 years ago. You know, incredibly dynamic spaces with entrance from all sorts of directions, um, all really being spurned by, um, generated by the people in this room, right, who are financing um, this really exciting period of growth. So enforcers need to be incredibly careful that they're not um, cutting this off um, in a way that's unintended. And unintended consequences, you know, are more likely to happen if you're not getting all of the data you need, if you're not subscribing to PitchBook, <laughs> to take Danny's example. Um, and this is true, right, in all areas of law. Regulators need to be careful not to have unintended consequences, but I think it's especially true in antitrust. You've heard this now a few times. Antitrust is a, is a fact-specific analysis. So uh, Maureen mentioned what you know, the law is, um, kind of the overarching law that, that regulates M&A. It's 
it basically says mergers are illegal if they are likely to lead to a substantial lessening of competition or tend to create a monopoly. That is so broad. Um, and the analysis is so fact specific. Um, if you're looking at whether there's an, um, an anti-competitive effect, you need to know what is the market? What are the potential entrants? What are the barriers to entry, if any? Who are the other market participants? What are the competitive dynamics of the space? Um, how do the um, acquirer and target behave in the marketplace, um, if at all? What are consumer, what is consumer behavior? What is price elasticity? What does the financing look like? You know, what are the sources of financing to spur new innovation in this space? All incredibly fact specific. And if, um, if regulators don't um, intimately understand the pieces of, of the, you know, all of the pieces and how they interact, including very importantly, the financing that's driving innovation, then there's an increasing risk that, um, that they'll over-index and potentially um, generate unintended consequences. Great, well, uh, Great Jeff Perry, I'm the general counsel at the National Venture Capital Association. Really pleased to be with Kelly and, and Danny and all of you today. Yeah, I think the first thing to mention is at NVCA, we represent more than 400 or, or so venture capital firms across the country. And those really range from the very largest firms that a lot of people have, have heard of, uh, firms that have existed on places like Sand Hill Road and, and Menlo Park for a long time, all the way down to very small and, and regional venture capital funds. And one thing that might surprise a lot of people is that when I think of, of our members that have reached out and, and expressed a lot of concern about a lot of the antitrust proposals, it, it tends to be disproportionately a lot of those regional, medium-sized, or even smaller venture capital firms. And, and the reason for that is that companies in their backyard that they tend to invest in and help grow don't tend to grow to the size that Danny mentioned to be able to go onto the public markets. And so disproportionately, a lot of those regional venture capital funds do rely on M&A activity and they look at what's going on in Capitol Hill and at the FTC and DOJ and, and they have a, a lot of alarm. And so another point I wanted to make here is that I think a lot of times people need to kind of take a step back and think about why it is that limited partners invest in venture capital in the first place. And if you think about the usual cast of characters that is investing in venture capital, it tends to be university endowments and, and pensions and foundations and family offices and, and things like that. And the one thing that they all have in common is that they've, they've got some pool of capital that they need to put to work for, for some obligation that is out there. And so a lot of times they're looking out and they're investing a certain amount of money in the public markets and they're investing maybe in some natural resources and buying timber and oil and gas or whatever the case may be. And then they have made some allocation, some judgment that they are looking for some outsized amount of return and they often call this alpha. And so what they do is they, they take a, a portion of that and they put it into the alternative asset class. And these are seen as the, the riskiest of all the investments that they're going to make and, and a, really a, a subset of those alternative assets tends to be venture capital. And we, we are the riskiest asset class of all of the risky asset classes out there. And we ask limited partners to give their money for the longest period of time. And we're closed end funds, meaning you sign a limited partnership agreement and, and you don't get to have your money back. You're, you're on the hook for the capital calls that happen. And so this is not for the faint of heart. This is a, a very harrowing thing that, that goes on and, and people that invest venture capital for a living, they are, are quite used to, as Danny mentioned, losing money. But as they say in venture capital, you can only lose one times your money, but the upside can, can be tremendous. And, and you're looking out there trying to find the companies that are really gonna grow leaps and bounds and really shape the future and, and, and be those outsized returns. And so that's the basic business of, of venture capital. And as, as was said at the beginning, when, when you're investing in these companies, there, there are really only three things that can happen. And bankruptcy is the most common thing that happens, and, and that is just the, the way it is. It, it's never going to change in our, in our entrepreneurial economy, but, but that is fine because the people that are involved in this are, are very sophisticated. They understand the, the realities of, of the system. And then the most common positive outcome that can happen to a lot of these entrepreneurs is that they go through some type of M&A acquisition and then the least of the of common of the, of the positive outcomes is they go onto the public markets. And one of the reasons that this is, is, has become the way it is 
is that the public markets have become more and more hostile over the years to small and medium capitalization companies. Danny touched on, on some of the regulatory challenge. There has also been a lot of cultural challenge in terms of just short-termism that has existed in the market. And so if you're that entrepreneur who's setting off on, on his or her journey, and you're looking out at someday ringing the bell on NYSC, the reality that you're going to get there, it, it's incredibly challenging. And so for a lot of entrepreneurs, they might set off on that journey, but they realize over time that really an acquisition by a larger player or by a peer is really going to be the most common. And so when we at NVCA kind of got involved in, in all this, this antitrust discussion a, a few years ago, we, we, were, we were starting to be approached by policymakers about this concept of, of acquisitions of, of nascent competitors, uh, killer acquisitions, as Maureen mentioned, that they are often, often called. And so we, we kind of looked around and, and asked ourselves, well, you know, gosh, is this you know, really what is taking place in, in the marketplace? Because it, it didn't, didn't seem quite right to us. So as it turns out, Danny, we do have a PitchBook subscription at NVCA. In fact, <laughs> PitchBook is the official data provider of NVCA. And so we took a look at the acquisitions over the course of the last 15 or 20 years. And what we determined was the, the fairest way to look at this was, was the ratio of acquisitions to IPOs, to kind of get a sense of, of all the positive outcomes that are out there, how are they kind of looking in comparison to each other. And, and what we found was, was fairly remarkable, which is that for the large part, this number is, is, is pretty much unchanged. You, you, you have about, you're, you're 10 times more likely to, to go through an acquisition than you are to, to go through an IPO. Um, I think that Ray quoted the Silicon Valley bank stat out there that 58% of founders intend to be acquired, but this is a little bit, the difference can be explained by kind of people's expectations versus the reality that's out there. And so what we have found is, is that this concept that, that somehow there are vastly more acquisitions now than there used to be in the past, it, it, it's really not the case. And, and I think that you know, one thing that has really governed a lot of our activity in this space is to try and present that data. So we, we have put that on the record at the FTC within their RFI. We've also put this before a lot of policymakers and whether on Capitol Hill or otherwise. And, and I think that you know, some people react to this well and they, they appreciate that perhaps there's a political meme that, that has taken off unfairly and people have looked at some of the more infamous acquisitions that, that, have, that have gone on. Um, others, I think, recognize that, that you know, or, or at least they don't want to be told the, the truth about this and that they find it very politically convenient to kind of pursue a, a certain path because big tech companies have become so, so negatively perceived among policymakers, and so um, that's a little bit of a background of kind of where we're coming at it from. Happy to dig in any details if uh, Ray wants to hit on those things. Jeff, thanks so much, and Kelly, thanks. Um, you know, I think it might be helpful to uh, dive into exactly what we're talking about in terms of what Congress is up to. Um, so maybe, um, and I'll go just go down the line. Um, you know, what what propose? What are the key proposals that are in Congress? Um, and what, what do they potentially mean for M&A, for entrepreneurs, and obviously for VC funding? Um, maybe if you want to start with Jeff and then go to Kelly and then Danny. Sure, I'm happy to kick it off. So the, the one that we've been most focused on is a bill called the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act. In the House, it was introduced by Mr. Buck and Mr. Jeffries. In the Senate, by Senators Cotton and, and Senators uh, Klobuchar. Um, I, I would, it, there's a lot that can be said about this bill, but it, it is effectively a ban on, on acquisitions by the four or five large tech platforms in, in this country. You know, I think the bill's authors would, would probably quibble with that and say that it's not kind of a, a blanket ban, that there, there are reasons why that's not the case. You know, the, the exceptions that exist for that, I, I, I would say, are, are, are really making a distinction without a difference. And so from our perspective, this is effectively would ban a lot of the M&A activity that's out there. And you know, this is something where the, the part of the conversation that we've tried to really bring to the forefront is, is again, trying to stress the, the impact, not on the four or five large tech companies, which frankly don't get a lot of sympathy up on, on Capitol Hill, but to look at the other side of the, of the table, which is the entrepreneur that wants to sell his or her company to one of these companies and also sees an acquisition as really the best opportunity both for the founders, but also for a lot of the employees at these companies. Because ultimately, when you're working at a startup, if you're an engineer or, or some other type of, of job there, you're probably not making all the money you could from a salary perspective, and you're being paid 
a lot in, in equity. And so perhaps going through an M&A activity um, would be quite exciting to you because it's finally a chance to realize a lot of the hard work you've, you've been putting on. And so in terms of where these bills stand, this was uh, one of the bills that, that passed as part of the suite of bills last year out of the House Judiciary Committee. It was something where the vote was quite fractured, where you, you did see a lot of Republicans you know, very, very much lining up behind Jim Jordan, the ranking member on the committee, and having some, some deep suspicion about the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act, as well as some of the other antitrust proposals that are out there. And then you also saw some, some very uh, veteran Democrats in, on the House Judiciary Committee um, that similarly had a lot of reservations and, and thought that the bills were, were not terribly well conceived or, or, or well thought out. And, and so it, was, it did ultimately pass through the committee, but you, but you had quite a bit of dissension. And then, of course, over in the Senate, um, this has not been one of the bills that, that's gotten much activity of, of late. It's, it's not been considered by the Senate Judiciary as a whole. I think that you know, my perspective is, is that a lot of the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee saw a lot of the back and forth that took place over, over in the House and, and saw a lot of the arguments that, that have been made. And that, thankfully, has, has really slowed the progress of, of this bill. And so I'm um, not entirely sure what the future holds for the Platform Competition Opportunity Act, but, but certainly with, with other antitrust proposals moving through the House and the Senate, it's something that we very carefully watch and, and want to make sure um, that, that really our views are, are, are being heard. Yeah, it's, um, it's a really interesting time on the Hill. We're seeing, you know, as Jeff mentioned, really, really strange bedfellows, um, you know, Senator Klobuchar and Hawley are agreeing, for example, on some element of antitrust law, while um, prominent uh, Democratic senators are challenging Klobuchar on the right path forward. Um, I think we can take comfort in the notion that there are, um, even though we're seeing some element of bipartisanship, we're seeing enough challenges on both the left and the right, you know, in the case of the Platform Competition Act, um, and the, in the case of the other acts that could affect um, M&A specifically. So um, Senator Klobuchar, for example, introduced a bill that would shift the burden um, on M&A for, um, for all deals that would result in over 50% market share. Um, or deals by um, a company with over, I believe it's a $100 billion market cap, um, or deals that result in a company that would have over $5 billion in uh, revenues or assets. Um, so, you know, taking this, the, the latter two factors aside, um, you know, how would one defend, define 50% market share um, when you're talking about uh, markets that are incredibly dynamic um, with, elements of competition that, you know, could be with all sorts of different players from all, from all sorts of different, um, uh, you know, backgrounds. Um, it's, you know, before, under, or under the current law, um, it's up to the government to show that a merger would be anti-competitive. Um, and there's, you know, a whole framework for that. But if this law were to pass, all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at a deal, you might be a relatively small company or a VC firm backing a relatively small company, and you're trying to decide, is, you know, are, do we hit this 50% market share? How is this even defined? So, you know, it could have an incredibly chilling effect. Senator Hawley has a bill that would make it automatically anti-competitive full stop for any mergers that um, are by companies with over a, 50, uh, a $100 billion market cap. Um, so, you know, perhaps we don't, nobody's crying over Google's ability to buy a company or Facebook's ability to buy a company, but really the concern, of course, as we all know in this room, um, that's the exit strategy for so many uh, smaller companies that are um, generating a lot of the in innovation that we're seeing in the American economy today. Fortunately, for all of us, um, and similar to the platform competition bill, uh, they've not seen a lot of support in Congress and they're not moving forward this session. Um, we'll see what happens next session. You know, if we continue to have um, a Democratic majority, I imagine the dynamic isn't going to change too much. Um, if we have a Republican majority, 
support for the bill may go down, but you know we definitely need, need to keep an eye out, right? Because there are some Republicans um, who are interested in moving bills like this forward. Um, there are two bills that are getting the most airtime right now. They don't directly affect M&A. Um, so that's the, I get all of these names confused. Um, the American Innovation and Choice Online Act. Um, that's the bill that Senator Klobuchar is sponsoring. And it would prohibit self-preferencing um, and a range of other perceived discriminatory behavior by, um, by big tech companies, you know, Amazon, Google. Um, and then there's also um, a bill that Blumenthal is sponsoring, the Open App Markets Act, which would prohibit Google, Apple, and similar, similar app stores from doing a variety of things to developers on their apps, um, including restricting um, in-app payments um, and also requiring them to apply fees in a non-discriminatory way. Um, these are the two bills that have the greatest chance of passage this session, um, although it's still, depending on who you talk to, either you know, slightly over or slightly less than 50%. Um, I think what we're most likely to see getting through this session is some sort of increased funding for the agencies. Um, so you know, the August recess is quickly approaching. Um, even if we're not seeing any of the antitrust specific bills, um, a reconciliation bill might um, attribute up to $1 billion dollars in funding to the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, which would give them a lot of the resources that they need to pursue, um, well, much of their agenda, which has been um, very capacity constrained, uh, at least until now. So uh, uh, I think we've already heard about the bills. I'm going to give uh, my particular uh, spin on them. So the, the first thing I'd say is, the, the, the question asks the antitrust bills, and though they're pushed as antitrust bills, in fact, it's not antitrust as we know. It's a more regulatory competition policy type set of bills that doesn't focus on traditional enforcement. So it's antitrust in name only, many of these bills. Uh, and I th think it would be better if people just came clean and say, this is some version of regulation. If, if we do, then we actually ask the basic question of what is it that we're trying to do? What motivates regulation? So again, I'm not against regulation. If you can express clearly what's the purpose of regulation and, and why do we need it? Because there's some kind of gap. And there are plenty uh, of, of gaps across many different fields. The question is, is there something that the antitrust laws are not doing? Right, I think would be the, the basic question here. And what are the kind of consequences that we have? So if the question is, we're against acquisitions, the question is, why specific companies and not other companies? Because normally we think of antitrust harm about a very fact-specific situation. So you know, if it focuses on just four or five companies in terms of banning acquisitions, the question is, well, why not also ban acquisitions by other companies that are serial acquirers. Oracle has as many um, acquisitions in a yearly basis as many of the GAFA companies. And in fact, one of them, Amazon, tends to have very, very few acquisitions. So could you explain the motivating factor here? Um, how about you know, the self-preferencing bill. So I want to focus on that one because, as Kelly mentioned, it's, it's the one that's been getting a lot of traction um, recently. So one problem with this bill and, and also some of the others is the language is vague. It doesn't track traditional case law. So we actually don't know what these words mean. Um, but it could mean a lot. It could mean a lot of bad stuff. Bad stuff, I mean, that hurts innovation. So let, let's take one step back and say, what do we already know? We know that companies that at one point were venture-backed, at this point, are roughly 70 75% of all R&D spending in the United States, um, which suggests that there's something about the kind of companies that scale up to a point and get acquired, and then uh, hopefully 
the, this, these complementarities create value in ways that we didn't have before of just two companies. It's not quite vertical. The 2010 horizontal merger guidelines call these diagonal markets. So we can say adjacent markets, but, but it's certainly not a vertical and it's not a horizontal. Um, the empirical work to date, there's the published work and then there's a series of working papers that are not quite uh, through peer review. So what do we know? It, you know, in the limited setting, uh, so number one, uh, at least in a static sense, we have a famous paper by Agarwal and Lee in Management Science, which is a, an A publication across a number of business fields that shows Facebook's integration of Instagram was pro-competitive, right? This is exactly what you want to see in an acquisition. Again, they only look at static, not dynamic. Um, but, the, you know, the limited empirical work we have tends to be more pro-competitive than, than not. We have some working papers that go in both directions depending what exactly they measure. But overall, I could tell you both working papers and empirical work, they tend to be on the pro-competitive side. So what work we do have that would and that should guide us suggests we don't need a wholesale change. But I want to focus on essentially the self-preferencing bill. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, it's really vague, but number two, there are these implications that Kelly suggested that goes to the VC ecosystem. So if normally one of the best set of acquirers are companies that might be covered under the legislation, they're out. That means who's left as bidders? Number one, if you're the entrepreneur, you're not getting as much funding because there is not a bidding war. So for those of you who have uh, been either on the selling end or on the buying end of housing uh, in, you know, since the pandemic realized the more bidders you have, the, the higher the valuation. That if, if, you're, um, if you're a seller, that's awesome. Let me be clear, really, really awesome for you. If you have fewer bidders, less good for you. Um, number two, it also deprives the market of that signaling function that I talked about earlier because you simply have fewer comparables. Uh, and this is a self-preferencing bill that really, I think, would ultimately impact the VC system, though that's not where we've had a lot of the discussion. The other area that I think you know, m matters is, in fact, not US legislation, but the impact of non-US regulation. So it turns out GDPR, something involving privacy. So let me be clear, privacy is good. Sometimes privacy works with competition. Sometimes it's sort of there in the sort of in a, again, an adjacent space. And sometimes it may be at odds with competition. So what do we know empirically? GDPR has actually negatively impacted AI investment in Europe and actually uh, led to a hardening of competition, which is say, uh, we've had more concentrated competition, less entry. Why? Because of the regulatory barriers. So areas that are close to but not the same as antitrust may impact antitrust. And this may chill all kinds of business taking behavior. And I think this was an, this was an unintended consequence. Everyone says, who could be against privacy? Well, in the abstract, no one. Um, when we actually get to details, the mechanisms and the incentives really, really matter. So there's a broader cautionary tale of what works and what doesn't work. What we see so far from the DMA, um, you know, that, that is where, again, we're not quite sure how it's going to play out and whether or not, A, we don't know what success is for the DMA, even though that, that was one of the motivating factors. You know, is it new companies? Is it different market share? We don't know. But we also don't know something else. Who is actually going to enforce it, right? So it's very clear from the DMA, it's supposed to be enforced at the European level, and yet we hear talk from a number of national competition authorities that they're going to enforce. So what do I see here? Uh, it's something that we see in a very different non-competition setting in the United States across a number of areas. Essentially, is this something that's been federalized, or is this left to a more localized level? There's essentially going to be, in my view, a constitutional law crisis in Europe with regards to competition law. Who enforces? Um, 
And whenever you have this kind of regulatory uncertainty, uh, it's more difficult for people to invest because they don't know that they're going to get the money out. So I'd say it's not just a US issue. We, we're already seeing this natural experiment play out in Europe affecting US companies because sometimes uh, acquisitions that would clear the United States are being challenged either in member states or even the, the, the UK uh, as a distinct entity now uh, or at the European level reviewed when you know it gets cleared in the United States. It could be that the local effects are different, but it also could be that they just have a very different way of viewing potential competition. And this creates regulatory uncertainty, which hurts venture capital investment. We want some certainty, but we don't want certainty because the rules are stupid. We want regulatory certainty because the rules allow for some amount of predictability that really weigh, let me be clear, real antitrust concerns on specific deals with the other aspect, which is the value creation aspect that benefits the venture capitalists, the entrepreneurs, and indeed society overall. Uh -huh. Cool, cool. So, so, so Danny reminded me of two things, um, one of which that I forgot to mention, um, which is that we're seeing this, um, obviously, a lot of federal activity, um, activity on the Hill um, in terms of new legislation for antitrust, but we're also seeing it at the state level. So this, um, this challenge that we're seeing in Europe um, with the Digital Markets Act and who will enforce, whether it's at an overarching EU level or at the state level and who sh who's best placed to regulate it. Um, we're also seeing here in the US states um, becoming increasingly active uh, in the antitrust space, New York specifically. Um, so uh, this past session, the um, New York State Legislature passed um, in the Senate, something called the 21st Century Antitrust Act. And um, it, it does a few things. It, it adds um, a monopolization standard, which didn't exist before. It might be tweaking uh, you know, criminal penalties, but like importantly for this conversation, it intended to add um, a mandatory merger notification regime. So you guys, I'm sure, are all familiar with the, um, the process at the federal level, companies of a certain size need to notify their merger under um, the Hart-Scott-Rodino Act. The, you know, the thresholds are quite, are quite high. Um, deals, you know, at least over 90 million, depending on the party size. The 21st Century Act intended to require merger notification for all deals that had an effect of, I think it's over $9 million in revenue in New York State. So if you are a company or you're a venture capitalist supporting a company that has $9 million revenue in New York State, you would, under this bill, um, if it passed, have to notify the deal to New York State law. That means you're automatically doing a merger review. And New York um, and this bill, unlike um, the HSR Act, which has a 30-day waiting period, it would be a 60-day waiting period. So that means automatically 60 days of waiting until you can actually close and start seeing the benefits of your deal. Um, this, you know, not only is it going to, um, I think, chill M&A, delay M&A, but I have to imagine that it would unintentionally um, burden smaller businesses more, right? Because larger companies are the ones who already know how to go through a merger review process. They have teams of in-house and outside counsel who can um, uh, navigate through a very complicated um, merger review system. It's the smaller companies, you know, and $9 million is, we're not talking a lot here, these smaller companies that aren't familiar with this process, who don't know how to navigate it, who will be the ones um, who are more likely to be harmed with something like this. So, you know, good news is this bill didn't pass this session. Um, it does seem like it will be raised again next session. Um, and it, it has incredibly um, broad support in New York. It passed in 2021. It passed the Senate by a vote of 43 to 20. So definitely something to keep an eye out um, when, um, when the next session in New York resumes. 
Kelly, thanks. I, as a as a person that just fled New York, and uh, I'm intimately aware of public policy there, that doesn't surprise me in the least, unfortunately. Um, what I'd like to, you guys did a great job covering a whole host of areas. And what I'd like to come back to is another issue and, and maybe have you explain it and then talk about the the VC perspective is this whole changing or, or moving away from the what we call the consumer welfare standard. Um, maybe a brief, if, I don't know if Danny wants to start off, maybe a little brief background. I believe that kind of emerged in the 1970s and it gave us some, some discipline to, um, to antitrust evaluation, at least from what I, my understanding, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about if we move away from that, what the implications are. So maybe if, if Danny, you want to start? So there, there's the consumer welfare standard as it was initially written. Then there's what we mean by it today. And the, and the two are distinct. And then there's sort of shorthand for what it means. So Bork first wrote it in the antitrust paradox. He, he invented the term, um, right? We, we would have thought of if it was economics, it would have been either total surplus or consumer surplus. He said consumer welfare. Why consumer welfare? Uh, I, I th and there's a large literature. I think largely because uh, the consumer movement was uh, Ralph Nader et al. Uh, was really growing in the United States in the early 1970s. You give it a nice sort of name. Uh, in his book, he said consumer welfare, and yet it was based on uh, work of now Nobel laureate uh, Oliver Williamson, uh, who actually didn't mean consumer welfare at all. He meant total welfare. Um, but the courts initially said consumer welfare but meant total welfare. Now when they say consumer welfare, they mean consumer welfare, which just means how do we care about end consumers, right? L largely, it's about output. So oftentimes, that's about price. But let me be clear, it's not only about price. It's about quality. It's about innovation. We've seen this in antitrust, not just recently. Frankly, we've seen non-price factors uh, for more than 100 years. And for people who call themselves neo-Brandesian who say that uh, non-price has never been an antitrust issue, perhaps they should read Brandeis's most famous antitrust opinion, Chicago Board of Trade, about non-price competition. Thank you very much. Um, or Brandeis's antitrust writing, where he actually favored um, minimum resale price maintenance, which is really about non-price competition across brands. Um, so what does consumer welfare, I think, really mean now? I, I think it has become shorthand for some kind of economic-based approach to antitrust. In today's world, again, unclear who you talk to and say, we're, we're against the consumer welfare standard, and you sort of push, well, what does that actually mean? I think. And again, there's not so much clarity, but I think for most people it means we need to be looking more holistically at a set of other factors, a broader public interest standard for those that are intellectually honest. Um, and therefore, it would look, I guess, akin to, say, the merger review that, say, the Federal Communications Commission does, uh, where there's a set of trade-offs. But what is not articulated now is how do you mediate across a number of different factors? So it might be pure uh, economic interest, uh, but it could also be other factors that you say are important, but you know, how, how would you address employment, right? What if it means that prices go up? What if it means prices go up particularly for the most vulnerable of consumers, right? Uh, there isn't a clear articulation of what that would mean. So we get you know, that the consumer welfare standard is under attack, but I think what they're really saying is economic analysis under attack. And, and so what is that really telling us? It's the, we have a set of outcomes we want to see, and we're going to simply reverse engineer the analysis to get to the outcome we want. The country that has done this best in, and by best, I don't mean necessarily best for the system, but just in terms of reverse engineering, um, I'd say would be uh, China under the anti-monopoly law. It's very clear that there's an industrial policy aspect. It's, it's quite explicit in the law, and they take it very seriously. And there have been a series of cases in, on the merger side that make it very clear. We want a certain outcome. 
It could be national security. It could be innovation in uh, strategic industries. It could be employment. This is what we're going to do, and we're going to reverse engineer an antitrust decision to get us to that outcome. If that's what we're talking about today, that's not antitrust as we know it on the merger side. That creates a lot more risk uh, if you're trying to invest in a company that ultimately is going to exit via m and uh, Kelly and Jeff, I mean, is that is that your is your main takeaway the the uncertainty and therefore the the reduction in venture potential reduction in venture capital funding if this kind of takes hold? I don't know that I have much more to add than what Danny said. Yeah, I mean, Danny is the professor, so he definitely encapsulated a summary of the history of consumer welfare um, better than I could. Um, I think I would just uh, connect what Danny said to something that Maureen mentioned at the beginning um, of her keynote, and Danny touched on this as well, which is that the um, antitrust framework, it's incredibly flexible, and the way that it's been enforced um, you know, over the last several decades already takes into account a variety of uh, non-price factors. Um, we see it both in the um, investigations that the agencies bring, in the cases that go to court, and in the case law that's been developed. Um, so to put antitrust enforcement into a box of, you know, right now it's only price effects and in the future it would be all of these other things is overly simplistic. Um, and when we hear conversations about how antitrust should take into account sustainability, um, labor law, employment policy, all of these other things, um, you know, there's, I think, many people would agree there are things the antitrust law should do and things that they shouldn't do. And there are ways, you know, for, to take into account sustainability and, um, and labor law in the, in, in, in the existing antitrust framework. So if we want to talk about sustainability competition, if you have two companies who, um, you know, I'm making up a hypothetical, but if you have two companies who are developing um, standards for, uh, I don't know, recycling, and then they merge, um, you can look at, is there competition there that would lessen because of that merger that would lead to a reduction in um, sustainability goals? For the labor laws, the antitrust laws for decades have looked at the effects of mergers on input labor markets. Um, so if this merger happens, will there be some sort of buying power in an upstream labor market? These are things that can already be um, enforced under the existing laws. And should we add to them these general notions of sustainability, labor policy, without having concrete tools? That's where we start to get into an area of, um, of unintended consequences. Um, before we go to any questions in the room, I, I want to push it a little bit in terms of my own time. <laughs> um, I, I like takeaways. So maybe for, for Jeff and for, for Kelly, um, you know, what are, what are things in this current environment that VC firms and entrepreneurs and companies um, can do? What, what should they be doing to make sure that we have a viable M&A marketplace and going forward? Well, I think one thing is, I mean, I, we've seen an incredible amount of engagement from the entrepreneurial ecosystem as it relates to the antitrust debate. And, and this ranges from you know, individuals testifying on, on Capitol Hill to providing information to the various agencies. And I, and I think that's all you know, great and, and healthy. You know, one thing I've, I've particularly seen that, that's very interesting is that you, 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 a lot of times the you know, focus is on you know, how does this impact VC, and I think that's the subject of today's panel, but in some ways I think it's kind of the, the wrong focus, and I think what we, what we all really mean by that is what's the, the impact on, on the entrepreneur, and I, I've seen that shift a little bit, and I think that's, that's really great. And I think another aspect of this that has kind of come out is that there's been more of a recognition, I believe, of what we've termed the, the recycling effect, which is individuals that, that once they go through a, in, an acquisition of their company, they don't tend to just go sit on the beach for the rest of their lives with all their you know, pile of cash and just kind of live out their days and, and, and do sort of all these fun things. 
these people, because of you know, the nature of, of who entrepreneurs are, very dogged people that, that want to solve problems, that want to do hard things, they, they tend to go on and, and form new companies. And so you see the, these serial entrepreneurs that, that go on to do all these great things. And, and this is a, another way of, of developing more economic activity. And even for those that, that don't tend to, to go on and become repeat entrepreneurs, they tend to give back into the entrepreneurial ecosystem in additional ways. A lot of them will take the capital that they've made and they'll become angel investors and invest in, in the next generation of companies. And then, of course, a lot of them go on to become venture capitalists. A lot of our members, people on our board that I, I deal with, um, are, are former entrepreneurs. And the reason that they are good VCs is that they have seen what it takes to launch a high growth company. They've seen how difficult it can be and how it is that you can traverse a lot of that. And, and so this is something where I think there's been more recognition that there's an ecosystem that exists that, that ultimately is very fragile. And a lot of these changes really could disrupt that and, and, and finally, I think you know, one thing that we're talking a lot about right now with the competitiveness bill up on, on Capitol Hill is, is really American leadership on, on these things. And this recycling effect, this ecosystem of, of involvement and, and kind of you know, people collaborating, it, it's something wonderful that our country has done, that, that not every country in the world can, can say that. And, and we're very fearful that that will get disrupted. And, and I've seen entrepreneurs really testify to this fact. Well, I definitely know I definitely now, know if now I didn't know, if I know before, what separates me from being an entrepreneur. Because I've, if I had a fat pile of cash, I would be sitting on a beach somewhere. Um, so I'm in-house antitrust counsel. Um, I counsel my client on, um, on a variety of things, um, litigation, um, ordinary course counseling, M&A. And I think what um, would be helpful for all of you guys to think about um, especially if you are in the rooms with your um, portfolio companies, your entrepreneurs, helping them you know, think about uh, business strategy um, or ultimately M&A strategy, is to really have um, in the back of your mind the, the way that antitrust agencies think about competition and mergers. So we've talked a lot today um, about what's going on um, in the enforcer's head, and they are asking themselves, will this deal substantially lessen competition? So from the outset of your investment, um, when you're thinking about um, your ultimate exit strategy or M&A strategy, think about, how do I tell my pro-competitive story? If this might be in your head, um, but put it on paper. You know, this is how we are innovating. This is how we are benefiting the consumer. This is how we're benefiting our partners. And when we go to, um, to market ourselves, this is how our sale will keep that competition going, how we will um, you know, continue to spur innovation, how we will expand product offerings, you know, how if this is a complimentary deal, you know, Danny gave a few of, the, um, a few of these examples, how our um, you know, combining these two companies will continue to expand options. Um, put this all down. It might be in your head, it's obvious to you, but the agencies, when they're going to do their investigation, they, you know, they are looking for evidence that, um, that, that proves what they're trying to find. Um, and if they see enough evidence that, you know, actually this is pro-competitive, um, that will help them get to the right decision. Um, so make sure that you are infusing that pro-competitive ethos in the documents that you're creating and, um, and uh, help guide your portfolio companies to just kind of to think about the environment um, and M&A in that way. Um, that will really help if you have that ethos from the beginning to um, to bring all of the evidence that you need when you get to that M&A stage to say, look, like this deal is good for our users and we've got the evidence to back it up. I'll make three quick takeaways. One local, one global, and then one regulatory. So on the local side, when entrepreneurs exit, it's exactly as Jeff said, but there's one important additional takeaway, the investments they make, the, you know, the part of the ecosystem they care about 
tends to have very localized effects. So if you have an entrepreneur in Ohio who sold off their company, the likelihood that their investment will be in Ohio or maybe possibly just broader uh, Midwest is very, very high. Their ability to contribute as an angel is going to be in that localized community. So by shutting off opportunities for entrepreneurship, you hurt local communities. Two, let's focus on global. What are, by total number of tech broadly defined, um, what are the three largest markets in the United States? Number one, Bay Area, not a surprise to people. Number two, and number three are gonna surprise you. It's actually New York City and Toronto. Um, which is to say, Toronto has more people in tech than Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, Boston, Austin, Texas, all the traditional tech hubs. Competition is now global. If we create an inhospitable tradition for entrepreneurship, that's okay. People can go to London for fintech. People can go to Singapore for fintech. People can go, frankly, to Shanghai for fintech. Um, we are competing globally. And the same way that people choose what state, to Kelly's earlier point on New York State, is more or less hospitable, investors and entrepreneurs are also playing this game. Uh, and this is, this is a broader regulatory arbitrage game. Uh, and, and we've seen this played. Number three, focusing specifically on the antitrust issues. So I think that there's, uh, Kelly raised something I think was absolutely critical for, for everyone to understand. If you're an entrepreneur or venture capitalist, you need to be able to explain what you do to regulators because it turns out regulators, um, and I, I say regulators because I think it's more broad than just DOJ and FTC, right? They don't necessarily understand your business model or frankly, your industry. You have to explain it to them. And one of, the, I think, the problems that we've had more broadly about tech is that companies were not particularly good at explaining what they did to government officials. And if they had been better at it, we wouldn't have many of the misconceptions we have now. But I'd also say that, frankly, a lot of companies are not really good at explaining to themselves what it is that they're doing and, and really and this is also incumbent on venture capitalists to really explain what are the, we think the potential risks that we have from a competition standpoint. How can we mitigate these risks ex ante so it's not a problem down the road? So I think everyone has a role to play in this because I think we all want a well-functioning system. And part of that is being able to translate competition concerns both to government officials but also within uh, the companies in, in which venture capitalists and corporate venture capitalists uh, invest in so as to mitigate potential competitive concerns down the road. That's great. That's perfect. Um, I don't see any questions online. So I wanted to see from Ogan if there were any questions in the room for anybody. Uh, right here. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. And since I have the mic, I might as well ask the first question. And then I can share it with others in the room. Um, Jeff, I had a question for you. Um, do you see, I mean, it, it, are you tracking at all? Is there any sense that either the, the regulatory or legislative clouds, and this might be difficult because given the economic environment in general, um, are having any impact on activity? Um, out there in your space. And then secondly, um, um, you know, obviously we all believe we need to talk to the regulators at the FTC and we need to make our voice heard. And there was a lot of concern, you know, over the past several months about the FTC changing processes and procedures and cutting red tape on their end, which really, um, you know, would harm our ability, you know, to, to engage and provide comments and to be heard. And I was just wondering if you think that's going to stick or, 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 or do you still have a shot, you know, at being heard there despite, you know, some of the changes that are being made at the FTC? You know, I, I think the, the, the tricky part is that 
num number one, a lot of the, the changes that are, are being proposed haven't been put into force yet, right? So a lot of it is, you know, people fearful of, of what, what could happen. And it, it's, it's not like someone's necessarily going to change their activity today based upon what might happen in, in 18 months, right? I think it's more what they would have to do kind of in 18 months when those things go into effect if they ever do. So it's, it's hard for me to say I've seen somebody, you know, not engage in certain behavior. I think, you know, you'd have to ask some of the larger tech companies if they might have changed their behavior based upon, you know, what, what it is that, that's gone on. But I don't really have a lot of in, insight, you know, into that. I think the other thing that's tricky too, Karen, is that we're, we're obviously in, a, in an economic downturn here and there are a lot of headwinds out there. You know, I think that someone alluded earlier that you know, it seemed like every quarter we were breaking more records in terms of both venture capital raised in, in, in discrete funds, but also venture capital deployed from those funds into particular companies. Um, that, that is you know, clearly going to be kind of going in the opposite direction here for, for a little while. And you're seeing you know, a slowdown in terms of things like first time financings, which would be like the first time a company uh, takes institutional capital into the company and, and what, whatnot. And so you know, those are going to be things where you know, the, 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 that data is going to be popping up here. And, and I, I don't want to be careful to kind of learn too many lessons out of that about you know whether that has to do with the regulatory environment or whatnot so I think that you know we'll keep on telling the story that, that we've had here and you know perhaps the data will become a little bit trickier to decipher but you know that's just a reality of, of trying to engage in public policy despite the economic conditions that are underlying all that hi Rob Wagner from Congressman Fitzgerald's office um, one FTC action, kind of picking, backing off your question, was um, that has kind of flown under the radar is their decision to suspend granting early termination for mergers that pose no threat to competition uh, back in February 2021. Um, I was wondering if you've seen any consequences on startups um, with that suspension being maintained now about a year and a half later. So th this is where actually some survey data would be really, really helpful. I, I mean, I could tell you all kinds of stories, but are the stories that I'm getting representative? I don't know, but the stories I hear are all bad. Um, that it's chilling behavior. Uh, so again, an incomplete picture, uh, but it, it's not a happy story. And I think something that's interesting is um, Cherlina Khan wouldn't be shy. She's publicly said her one of her intentions is to to chill behavior. I mean, the words that she used was um, these letters are necessary from uh, a resource perspective. Um, you know, we've seen um, M and A skyrocketing in you know end of 2020 through 2021. They don't have the resources to deal with it. So, so that's one. Um, objective that she had, but also she said publicly, I want these letters to stop um, anti-competitive M&A. The problem, of course, is that um, how do you define anti-competitive M&A, right? We're looking at um, an FTC that seems incredibly hostile to the notion of mergers and acquisitions having any pro-competitive benefits at all. Um, so when you are a company looking at the, uh, the regulatory space, Maureen talked about this as well, you know that you're seeing um, an uphill battle. And so you might believe and know that your deal is pro-competitive, that it's good for your users, that it's good for your investors, that it's going to contribute to the economy in all of these great ways. But you're looking at um, you know, a path that is 12 months, 18 months of incredibly difficult um, advocacy in front of the agency, incredibly expensive advocacy, getting outside counsel that's you know, costing millions of dollars, only to see the result that you're hoping for 18 months down the line, if at all. So, um, so it's actually one of the objectives of the FTC is to slow down M&A, um, which is, um, which is frustrating, as we've all talked about um, in this room, because M&A is 
one of the engines of growth that we have here in the US and um, one of the primary exit strategies for small companies that are bringing new products um, and ideas to market. Do we have other questions? Hearing none, and I'm at a distance, so I'm at a disadvantage, but um, I wanna say I apologize for not being there today. I had a family-related emergency, so I'm sorry that I missed this in person, but um, this was a wonderful panel. I wanna thank Danny, Kelly, and Jeff. You guys are just fantastic, and maybe a round of applause there for them. And I will turn it, I don't want to get in Andrew's way, of course, but I'll turn it over, I guess, to Karen. Karen, are you there and are you taking it away? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, Raymond, thank you so much. And thank you to all the, the panelists. That was just a fabulous uh, discussion. We're going to take a, a break. Um, just want to let everyone out, out there uh, know online. And we'll be back with you shortly uh, for our next panel on the entrepreneur's perspective. So um, stay tuned and hang on and we'll be with you soon. So, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. I hope everybody had a productive break. Uh, I'm Andrew Sherman. I'm a partner at Safarth Shaw. I'm in our corporate and M&A practice. Uh, I've been practicing in the area of mergers and acquisitions for over 35 years. And uh, this panel will pick up where the other panel left off. We're going to be really focusing on the entrepreneur and small business perspective. Um, it's hard to talk about the venture capital perspective without bleeding into entrepreneurship and small business owners, but we've got a lot of different things to talk about on this panel. Um, I want each of our panelists that's here to introduce themselves, and more importantly, not only themselves as people, but the organizations that they represent. We're blessed to have literally millions of small business owners represented by uh, the organizations that are with us this morning. And I do want to remind the audience that while the venture capital perspective is very, very important, there are millions and millions of small businesses that will never access venture capital, may never access third-party capital at all, and they're just as interested in exit planning and mergers and acquisitions as the venture-backed companies. Uh, I was kind of glad in some ways that our previous panel focused a little bit on that venture capital Sand Hill Road experience because we've still got about 95% of the country's small businesses uh, represented by the panel that you're about to hear. Um, if John, you wanna start out and tell us a little bit about CAE. Sure, thank you, sure, thank uh, you Andrew. Uh, and Thank you for the uh, uh, to the organizers of the event and for the invitation to participate. I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, we had a COVID scare in the house, and out of great respect for my fellow panelists, I decided to participate remotely. Uh, I'm John Deary. I'm the founder and president of the Center for American Entrepreneurship, which is a nonpartisan uh, research, policy, and advocacy organization. Uh, our job is to work with policymakers uh, uh, in Washington and at state and, um, uh, and local uh, levels across the country on behalf of startups and entrepreneurs and with our colleague organizations uh, in Washington, like NBCA, like the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council, et cetera, on behalf of American entrepreneurs. John's organization, John's but take a look at his board of directors, take a look at the boards of all the organizations you're going to be hearing from the representation of America's small businesses and the voice of emerging enterprises is very strong on all three. Uh, Todd? Thanks, Andrew. I'm, the, I'm Todd McCracken. I'm the president and CEO of the National Small Business Association. We're uh, what we sound like we are. We're a national small business organization <laughs> representing the needs and uh, mostly in public policy of the needs of the small business community. So we advocate for an environment that creates uh, the best possible environment for small business uh, growth, startup, and success. Um, and so uh, this is what topic obviously we're, we're very keen to, to discuss because so much of the reason that the small businesses start and succeed is so they can eventually sell and move on. Um, and this uh, sort of cuts to the heart of that. So but we'll be talking a lot more about that. And my dear friend, Karen. Well, great. It is um, absolutely um, a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm Karen Kerrigan, President and CEO of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. 
and we are uh, an advocacy research and education organization dedicated to uh, protecting small business, promoting entrepreneurship, and for uh, nearly 28 years now, we've worked on or have been working on a range of issues um, and uh, private sector initiatives to strengthen the ecosystem for strong uh, startup activity and small business growth. And um, obviously the issue that we're talking about today is, 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 is critical to that end. And it's just always an honor to be working with um, or being on the panel with uh, many of my fe fellow panelists. Um, we've worked with both uh, Todd at NSBA and, and John at CAE. And I think we've also, we have, we filed comments and signed letters with engines. So I think on this issue, it's, it's really important that we all continue to work together and to educate the lawmakers and regulators because um, it is critical to uh, US innovation, um, entrepreneurship, and, and, and the future of startups. So, is Nathan online? Line, 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 line. I'm here. I don't know if you can see me, but uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, Jin, 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 excellent. Jin. Uh, I'm Nathan uh, Linfors, I'm a policy manager at Engine. Uh, filling in on this panel for our executive director, Kate Tamarello. Uh, she sends her apologies in regards to not being able to make it. Um, we're a Washington, D.C. based nonprofit. Uh, we work with a network of startups all across the country, and Andrew alluded to this at, at the beginning. Uh, we work with a network of, of thousands of startups, so literally um, adding to those, those millions of, of voices uh, of small businesses and, and startups and entrepreneurs um, that are represented here. Represented, 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 um, and uh, looking forward to digging into this session with everyone. Thank you very much. And, uh, we will be joined by Bettina Hine in about a half an hour uh, to reinforce the entrepreneur's perspective. I'm just going to embarrass the panel one last time, and then I promise not to do it again. Um, this is a panel, when I say that represents the voice of small business and entrepreneurship, I mean, some of you in the uh, online audience may not realize these are the heavyweights, not physically, uh, but the, the heavyweights of small business and entrepreneurship policy. When Congress needs to hear how something impacts small business and entrepreneurs. Uh, these are some of the leading minds, not just in the country, but in the world. Todd, Karen, and others have, uh, have traveled around the world and uh, talked about the entrepreneurial ecosystem that the previous panel spoke to from the investor's perspective, but we're gonna do our best to give it to you from the trenches on the entrepreneur and small business owner's perspective. Um, I'm gonna, give maybe five minutes of comments, and then we're gonna uh, turn it over to the panel on a couple of different topics, and we'll see how it flows and see what questions you have for us in the audience. As I mentioned, I've been practicing in the area of M&A for about 35 years. I, as an M&A lawyer, you're typically either on the sell side or the buy side. That's uh, your two choices. Sometimes you're representing the capital, uh, but on the sell side, you know, I've experienced literally billions of dollars of wealth creation and enterprise value creation as a result of an unfettered pathway to M&A. I can't begin to tell you with 35 years of emotion how critical it is to keep that highway without speed bumps and toll booths and unencumbered uh, pathways to exit. Our small businesses across the country, as I mentioned earlier, many of which are not venture backed, are relying on a pathway to exit. And many of them are relying on exits via mergers and acquisitions, and they're particularly focused as Davids in selling to Goliaths. If we take away uh, or make too encumbered this pathway, the unintended consequences are severe. And they're not just severe in the ways that the first panel talked about. It's not just a policy issue, it's a community issue. It's a wealth creation issue. Let's take the typical small business in the Midwest making automobile parts of no interest to any venture capitalist or even angel investor. It might be a small family owned business 
It may have 100 or 200 employees. They may have at some point given out stock options to those employees. One issue we're going to talk about on today's panel that was not discussed in the previous panel is what are the unintended consequences to our nation's employees who may have taken stock options in the companies that will be selling. Uh, another issue is this issue, I, I wrote a book about this a couple years ago, Karen and I have spent time talking about it, uh, this issue of disengagement and culture. Remember, our topic today is around the impact on the innovation ecosystem. People innovate when they're engaged. People innovate when they're motivated. People innovate when they're rewarded. They're rewarded primarily through stock options. They're rewarded through stock options. The only thing that is of value to them when they receive a stock option is the ability to sit at an M&A closing table along with the owners of the company and get some participation in the benefit of the sale. I have watched employees at closing tables hundreds of times go from having a couple thousand dollars in the bank to having very significant money in the bank and the change that it has on their lives. I've also seen companies where their stock options become valueless. Just last night, I watched a late night Bloomberg interview with the founder and CEO of Zendesk, a company trying to find a secondary market for the hundreds of companies whose stock options have become either illiquid or uh, uh, lacking in value. The consequences of taking away you know, the, the number of companies that go public in the Sand Hill Road uh, world will always be you know, a relatively small percentage relative to M&A. But in the non-venture capital world, it's almost zero. I mean, almost no non-venture-backed companies will find their way to the public markets. Their exit is either to sell to their employees or to sell to a larger company or a competitor. The other thing that wasn't mentioned, I think, yet is the impact of COVID-19 on M&A. We have just hopefully, uh, you know, we are the three of us unmasked. Uh, we are hopefully at the tail ends of uh, COVID-19. And we went through a period in our country, not only of a pandemic, but of tens of thousands of baby boomer owned companies adopting a little bit of YOLO, right? You only live once and deciding that maybe they don't want to work until they're 70 or 75. And so we're seeing as M&A lawyers a significant uptick in the number of people interested in selling their business, in selling their business to larger competitors. Remember, many of these small business owners, as John and Todd and Karen and Nathan can attest, the bulk of their net worth is tied up in these companies. They may have limited retirement savings and limited net worth, and their net worth is tied up primarily in the company, in the illiquidity of the company. If you take away the liquidity of the possibility of a sale, you are uh, greatly impacting not only wealth creation in this country, but job creation. You are creating a much, much higher chance of disengaged employees and a lack of innovation. Um, we, we will not be able to stay competitive as a country if we take away or make too uh, encumbered the pathway to exit. Another point that hasn't been raised yet is the cost. The cost of regulation in M&A is already significant. Ask any small business owner who sold their company what their legal and accounting and professional and investment banking fees and fairness opinion fees and all kinds of third party consultants that they had to hire to satisfy the buyer's due diligence. It's starting to really cut into, and this is a lawyer speaking, okay? I'm one of those invoices, but the aggregate of those invoices is starting to really cut into the transactional costs on a sell side transaction. Now, if you add to that antitrust compliance, you are significantly adding to the bill at the end of the day. For many small companies, the one thing that they don't need to worry about because they were relatively small was creating some anti-competitive effect uh, on consumers. So there's a lot to talk about today. There's a lot to understand. 
uh, that goes beyond venture capital and goes beyond investment. Many of our America's small businesses are relying on their, what they consider to be almost constitutional right to build a business, to grow that business, and to eventually sell that business. So with that, because uh, I could go on for hours, and I've got my usual 80 pages of notes that I won't bore you all with, but I'd like to turn it over as a panel, uh, but with John starting off, we heard a little bit about the pending legislation from the perspective of the uh, venture capitalists, but let's talk about what's pending from the impact that it might have on entrepreneurship and small business, if we could. Uh, John, if you could start us off, and then Todd and Karen and Nathan, please jump in. Well, uh, thank you, Andrew. That th those were terrific opening uh, remarks, and I have to also say that the uh, this event has been uh, terrific. The previous panel was terrific, and Maureen's opening comments, her keynote was uh, was great and hit on all the right points. Danny, Kelly, and Jeff um, uh, made so many important points, and um, but I'm glad that we finally gotten to the uh, perspective of the entrepreneur, small business owner, because that ultimately. Uh, is really uh, the bullseye of this issue. So uh, thank you, Karen, and everyone else uh, uh, who arranged the event to include um, uh, uh, such a terrific panel on this topic. So, um, you know, we at the Center for American Entrepreneurship, you know, just based on our own perspective um, and our focus on entrepreneurship, um, had our own concerns about the legislation when it was introduced. And as we absorbed it and, and studied it, became, it came to understand it. Um, but we wanted to know in more specific terms and directly from entrepreneurs, because we're supposed to be working on behalf of entrepreneurs with policymakers here in Washington, what they thought. Uh, it's very easy for all of us in Washington to fall into the inside the beltway thinking that we know what's best. Uh, and uh, at CAE, we, we try to get out of Washington on a regular basis and conduct roundtables with entrepreneurs to stay in close touch. Uh, with them and their priorities and issues and concerns. So we put together several roundtables uh, with entrepreneurs uh, in more than a dozen states around the, uh, their businesses headquartered in more than a dozen states around the country uh, to ask them uh, directly, uh, are you concerned about this le le uh, uh, legislation? What would it mean for you in your startup? Uh, and if you are concerned, why are you concerned? Uh, and I can tell you uh, that they are, beyond concern. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it's fair to uh, report that they are terror stricken uh, by what this le uh, legislation could potentially mean for them, particularly uh, the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act uh, uh, that would uh, explicitly restrict acquisitions of smaller companies by larger companies. And, I, and uh, in, in, in listening to them, I think there are four principal takeaways or four principal concerns that entrepreneurs have that all fall under the category of a basic disagreement uh, between entrepreneurs and participants in the nation's entrepreneurial economy and the drafters of the legislation. And that basic uh, disagreement is that mergers are somehow anti inherently anti-competitive and anti-innovation. Uh, and what the entrepreneurs know and what they will tell you is, is not only is that not true, but acquisition is absolutely critical and absolutely essential uh, to uh, 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 the entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem, uh, and for a number of reasons. Um, uh, you know, Bettina Hine, who was mentioned, um, is going to be joining us soon, testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee back in December. And prior to her testimony, Senator Durbin made the comment, I think, in sort of a preemptive comment to Bettina's testimony, uh, that he simply couldn't imagine uh, why an entrepreneur would want to sell their company instead of going public, that it just seemed to him natural that all entrepreneurs who start a company would, would want to take that company public. Of course, there are all kinds of reasons why, and, and perfectly legitimate reasons, why an entrepreneur uh, would elect to sell their company. As, as was noted in the earlier uh, panels, uh, not all startups uh, are ready for prime time or, or should go public. Uh, the uh, the innovation or the technology that de that they develop, they're not in a position to take it to the next uh, level. Exactly, John. I'm 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 going to be a little rude and interrupt you because I want to drive home a very critical point. the The panel today is about the innovation ecosystem and the impact on innovation if these things move forward. And John, wouldn't you agree in the roundtables that you've done 
that from a pure innovation development perspective, there are technologies that will reach technological glass ceilings if they are not eventually turned over through acquisition or licensing or joint ventures, but more typically acquisition, um, in order to, to harvest them into their most mature state. Um, you take a look at Meta, uh, that was once known as Facebook, uh, Giphy, Instagram, WhatsApp, you know, these are technologies that potentially we may not have heard of until they've arrived on that larger platform with all the research and development engineers that the bigger companies can bring to the table. So um, if we're really going to focus on the best interest of the consumer and the consumer's ability to harvest technology, I can tell you from an innovation management perspective, there are times when small businesses run out of innovation pathway and need to sell to the bigger company in order for the innovation to mature, in order for the innovation to continue to be as useful to the consumer as we want it to be. Would, would you agree with that, that John? That, that's John? exactly right. That, that's exactly right, Andrew. And that was the point I was trying to make, that that that, uh, that that is a reality of the innovation ecosystem and therefore is a perfectly legitimate reason why entrepreneurs would look to sell their company instead of going public. It's also the case that many entrepreneurs don't regard themselves as scalers uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and growers of companies, that they regard themselves as founders, as entrepreneurs, as establishers. And once they did that, that's what they love to do is found companies and establish them and work on them and get them on their feet and then sell and go out and do it again. Um, uh, uh, I think was uh, referenced on, on the previous panel. I think Ray, um, um, uh, mentioned the Silicon v uh, Valley Bank uh, survey that um, something like two thirds or 58% of entrepreneurs actually expect and hope that their company will be acquired. Um, the, the, the most fundamental concern of the entrepreneurs at our roundtables, though, is the really fundamental uh, purpose and importance of acquisition in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And that is the, yeah, is the, yeah, exit, is the for, exit for entrepreneurs and for their, very importantly, for their investors. And the concern among entrepreneurs is that if there is, if if exit for their investors becomes either impossible or even sufficiently uncertain or comp or complicated, that investors will be far less likely to invest in their companies in the first place. And without investors, there are no startups. There is no startup ecosystem. Um, uh, the uh, 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 second problem, or the their second concern, is that as Kelly mentioned in the previous panel. Uh, the legislation would actually shift the burden it would, or turn it completely on its head. Currently, uh, the burden of proof is on the regulators to prove that a, 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 an applied for acquisition is anti-competitive or anti-innovation. The Platform Competition and Opportunity Act would turn that burden of proof completely on its head uh, and put the acquirers in the impossible position of, of having to prove a hypothetical. And that is that the, the acquisition uh, is of a company that, that uh, neither now or ever in the future would ever be a competitive threat to them. That's just a practically unworkable um, uh, requirement on the part of, of, of potential acquirers. And even if there weren't the explicit uh, restrictions in the act, just the that act of turning or shifting the burden or turning the whole exercise on its head is very chilling uh, uh, to acquisition and, is, and a great concern to entrepreneurs. Two other, um, uh, concerns that were not brought up in the previous panels, and I'll wrap very uh, quickly here to turn to Todd, uh, is that um, by making the acquisition process much more complicated and expensive, uh, the act would, in effect, increase the cost, and Andrew, you, you referred to this in your opening remarks, would increase the cost, the regulatory cost and burden of acquisitions, and that that would have the effect of that, that acquirers would, in effect, pay for those costs by by reducing the price at which they're uh, willing to pay for an acquired company so that the the people who are going to get stuck with the cost uh the increased cost of acquisitions are going to be the entrepreneurs who are trying to uh, uh, uh monetize the value of of what they have created over years of hard work and then finally their concern is that the act could have precisely the opposite effect that it is intended to have. The act is, is clearly aimed at, at the large dominant uh, innovation platforms or digital platforms. And the, the whole purpose of the act is to reduce 
the ability, the capacity of those large firms to acquire companies. The, the concern on the part of entrepreneurs is that by making the, the acquisition process so expensive and so complicated, so complex, that it will only be the largest companies that have the resources and the, law, and the lawyers necessary to navigate the, the complex new rules uh, such that it will it will have the effect of deepening and widening the competitive moat around the, the around the large incumbents because smaller competitors will not be able to clear the hurdle uh, of the regulatory uh, burden and cost associated with the new uh, regulatory landscape. Um, uh, and, and I think that this is a reasonable concern, of course, because we've seen this happen before in recent memory. Sarbanes-Oxley, for example, as was mentioned before, was aimed at large corporations following the, the uh, corporate accounting uh, abuse scandals of the early 2000s. One of the unintended consequences of Sarbanes-Oxley associated with Section 404 and the costs of complying with Section 404 is that sub $100 million IPOs small IPOs in the five years following the enactment of Sarbanes-Oxley plunged by 95% because it's simply too expensive to comply with, with, with Section 404. So in many ways, the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act is trying to clean up a problem or circumstances that Congress itself created by way of the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley. Another recent example, of course, is Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank was aimed at the big banks to rein in the big banks, to enable, to make sure that they were not able to inflict, you know, another financial crisis on the economy, uh, the U.S. economy and the global economy. Um, uh, today, 10 years after the passage of Dodd-Frank, the big banks are bigger and more profitable than ever. The only difference is, is that 2,000 small community banks have disappeared in the process. So very often on legislation, we talk about unintended consequences. One of those unintended consequences that we often see, particularly in sweeping uh, a legislation, is, is, is that it has precisely the opposite effect and that, and that it benefits the large incumbents at the expense of smaller competitors. In this case, in the case of the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act, the, the most vulnerable sector of, of the economy is the startup and entrepreneurial economy. And, and entrepreneurs are deeply concerned about that effect. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap there and uh, uh, hope that my colleagues can pick up there. Thank you, John. Uh, there's a bunch of great points you've made that I do want to come back to, but Todd, you've also been speaking to your members and sounds like you've got some similar, they've got some similar concerns. Yeah, very similar views. Uh, good remarks, John. Um, the uh, thing I want to come back to before I get to that though, is to just sort of underline why this is so fundamentally important. I mean, the reality is not just a lot of innovation, but most innovation in our economy comes from small companies, comes from startups, comes from these fast growing firms. And uh, it, it is through that innovation that we increase our productivity and that's where all of our economic growth comes from. So this is fundamental to, uh, to the strength of our economy. We gotta get this right and we shouldn't be um, taking unnecessary risks. So I just wanna really undermine why this is just crucially important, not just for small companies, not just for their owners, not just for their employees, but for the entire economy. Um, and yeah, we have been talking to our members recently. We actually have a survey that's been in the field. It's not been publicly released yet, but it's, it's complete enough that I can give you a little bit of a, of a preview. And it shows exactly what John found uh, in, their, uh, in their roundtable. This is the broad-based survey of, 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 of a significant number of small businesses nationwide and uh, working specifically at business succession and planning, and we asked about mergers and acquisition. And sure enough, uh, fully half of these companies see merger and acquisition as, as, their, ultimate, uh, uh, as their ultimate goal. Um, and, and so they're deeply concerned about, uh, about anything that might change, might disrupt that, might get in the way of that. Um, and uh, uh, we asked them also if they you know, would oppose the kind of legislation that we are seeing and fully three quarters of those companies, you know, there were some that didn't know, didn't know, didn't feel like they knew enough, but three quarters said yes, they were strongly opposed to anything that would restrict their ability to, to, to sell, their, sell their business to a, to a, to a, larger, uh, a larger enterprise down the road. Um, that, I should add, that number is higher than the, the number of businesses that even want to sell their company. So, so there's a significant concern. They, they understand, right, that this is unfair even to those other companies uh, that, uh, 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 they aren't part of. 
So it's a, it's, it's, it, I think this is something that really resonates in the small business community. And, and the reason is, you know, I also want to just step back and it's very easy to, to listen to this argument and think about, well, it might affect how much the company can be sold for and, and uh, um, uh, uh, what that market looks like for the owners. And it, sound, and it may sound to people at times like it's a debate about, you know, just how rich a few people are going to get, not about how much it affects the economy. But the reality is these, these people are entrepreneurs because of this whole process, and they're not going to get the investment. They often aren't going to start the company, uh, and we're not going to see this innovation and all of this productivity for the whole economy if the ability for them to sell down the road is taken away or significantly impaired. Uh, so it's not about you know, a handful of, of wealthy people. It's about uh, the whole ecosystem that we have built in this country that we need to step back sometimes and realize it's, it's despite all of our problems, it is the most successful one in the world B because there is uh, risk taking, because we've created a, a, an environment where, where innovation is rewarded. And so um, uh, that, 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 those are really the, the messages that I wanted to get across and that, and that the small business community, you know, gets it. And I think is prepared to be really engaged in this as it rolls forward. And I think they're 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 beginning to see what is what is beginning to happen. So, and, and Todd, there are tens of thousands of those transactions that aren't even captured by PitchBook. That's know, right. That are below the radar screen. That's of, exactly of right. The pitch books uh, that's the other thing I, the I would I was I would I would add is our survey is of the small business community nationally. It's 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 not of high growth, high tech, venture backed companies. These are the, the, the these are the companies you were talking about. Uh, Andrew, the, the 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 auto parts manufacturers and you know the the main street companies that uh, we think of when we think of the small business community. Those are the people who hold, hold these views, who are having these issues and concerns. So, Karen. Yeah. Well, uh, gosh, John and um, Todd made some fantastic points, and um, you know, I don't know what I can do to add to, <laughs> you know what they said about specifically what business owners and entrepreneurs are saying, you know, about this issue, their concern. I think, you know, what what I'll address is, it, well, a few things. Number one, um, look at, you know, the last, you know, couple of years there's been a lot of disruption in our economy and, you know, many business owners are still grinding it out and digging out. And now we have these new headwinds, you know, the new challenges of, of inflation, um, you know, supply chain, labor shortage, I mean, the list goes on and on and on, economic uncertainty. So when I talk to um, business owners and entrepreneurs in all of our surveys that we've done, whether it was our startup uh, survey or survey of startups that we, we released two and a half, three months ago, or a new survey that we released last week um, uh, from small business owners, is that where is the problem here? Because they right. want, they really want Congress a, and a the administration. In search of a problem, yeah. And, I mean. you know, their elected officials and leaders focused on their pain points, you know, which are, as they you know, inflation and supply chain issues, high health insurance costs. I mean, all these other issues that are really uh, making it very difficult, you know, for them uh, to operate. Uh, and to grow and maybe even survive, you know, um, in the current economy and under current uh, conditions. So um, that's number one. And number two is, you know, just, you know, the premise that um, either the legislation or the merger review guidelines that were discussed earlier, you know, are being considered um, from our perspective are, are a false premise in terms of the, you know, there's not enough competition in the economy. Um, and if you look at the empirical evidence over the last 20 years, I mean, there's, there's more competition, there's less consolidation. That's not to argue, Andrew, that in certain sectors, you know, like in healthcare or, you know, certain sectors, there is that occurring or has, because the barriers to entry from our perspective because of regulation and government right. interference make it so. But, but you're making so, a great point. You yes. know, we just had, one of the in-house counsels of Uber, right? Mm -hmm. Just a year or two ago, we had California AB5, remember? Yeah. And, and they interviewed Uber drivers, and Uber drivers said, we don't want the benefit of the regulation that the regulators are bringing to us. We <laughs> reject it. We're, I know that's who they're trying to protect, but we're not interested. 
And I think there, what we're hearing from, from all three organizations is, um, you know, thank you, but, but you're misguided in what you're trying to protect. You're not understanding what's really important to us. Is that a fair summary? I think that's, that is a very yeah. fair a summary, Andrew. And, you know, beyond that, I think, um, look at, I think there's still a lot of challenges ahead for our economy, the, you know, the supply chain. I mean, entrepreneurs and startups are going to be the solution. And, and thankfully, as we talked in the last panel and in opening remarks, we really, you know, we talked about this entrepreneurial surge, this high level of new business creation, uh, new business applications. I mean, some of the, you know, they still have to launch the business, but still, you know, 5.4 million business applications that were filed in 2021, 53% increase over 2019. I mean, this is really great for our economy. These are entrepreneurs who can solve a lot of the problems, who can, uh, you know, there's been a lot of transformation in our economy, who could bring new solutions to the marketplace, that can be competitors, you know, to the current big guys right now. Um, in our startup survey, um, and I know we talked about the Silicon Bank survey that found that, you know, 48, what is it, 53, 50 something percent, right, um, right, of those companies want to be acquired. Well, that's in an area that's concentrated with technology, and so that, that number doesn't. I think the number is much higher if you start including the non tech, non venture capital. Right. Companies. So, but, but in our start of, of startup entrepreneurs over the past, uh, you know, two years who started their business, look, 13 percent absolutely know they want to be acquired, right? Another 38% said, well, we'll see what happens after I build a business. So, you know, they're, so I think a lot more of them, obviously, when they build a business, when they become more mature, um, you know, as they're, as they're you know, getting in a, in a healthy growth, growth phase, you know, that will, the light bulb will go off and they'll want to do that. So the, um, but, but I'm telling you, and also with the startup entrepreneurs in terms of this competitive economy, you know, we asked them, I, we, it, look, 80% said, yeah, my market is very, very competitive, um, but I'm going to launch this business anyway. Right. You know, so they, they view, so they feel like they can compete in the economy, they can provide competitive advantage, and this was across all sectors, right. too. So you, you get the point that I'm trying to make, very right, in so. terms of the premise of why are we doing this. It's not to say they can't be targeted or other types of reforms. But when you're upending a system that has worked very well, that you know is massively I mean, responsible for a lot of the innovation in our economy, that is needed as it connects a business that can't grow any further, that can't take it to the next phase with, you know, another larger uh, entity that can use its scale and its resources to bring up benefits to consumers. And by the way. Your point raises a really important point I wanted to cover in my opening remarks and didn't get a chance. For many sellers, there's two categories of buyers. There's strategic buyers and there's financial buyers. Mm -hmm. Strategic buyers are the people we've been talking about since 8.30 this morning. The financial buyers are the private equity folks. The private equity folks, uh, there is a theory, we don't know yet, that as interest rates continue to rise, and private equity uses leverage to do their acquisitions, will have a little sit on the sidelines. And that most of the exits will be to strategic buyers, which is the focus of today's program. So if that's true, and the private equity is going to sit on the sidelines for a bit as interest rates rise and they adjust their acquisition models, we can't run the risk that we're making strategic acquisitions unattractive because that may be the only path Selling to private equity may not be as available in 2023 as it was, say, in 2019 or 2020. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to come to Nathan because, Nathan, you have recently, uh, I know it's not published yet, but hopefully you'll tell us a little bit about it. Um, you've been focusing on the impact of this uh, also in middle America and particularly in rural-based businesses. Um, there is the risk always when we talk about these, talk topics, about these topics that we're talking about the East Coast and the West Coast, but in between are what we lovingly call the flyover states. And uh, there are 45, 46 states that don't get mentioned as often. So Nathan, tell us a little bit about what about Engine's, what been, Engine's doing been doing in looking at the impact of this on uh, rural and agricultural-based businesses. 
Thanks, Andrew. And uh, yeah, I'll get to that in, in a second. But I guess um, for everyone, you know, if I wanted to give uh, kind of one sentence takeaway from, from this panel for everyone is a robust M&A market uh, is critical for the dynamism needed in the startup ecosystem and for innovation. Acquisitions are an exit path that not only helps the flow of capital, but also the flow of talent through the ecosystem. And I really want to, Andrew touched on this at the beginning, I really want to talk about that um, and, and press on it. Um, my fellow panelists, the previous panel, y'all well established um, kind of the investment piece, but I do want to press in on a few points. Um, uh, and there first, uh, one, exit via acquisition and investment isn't just some descriptive relationship that, that Andrew and, and others gathered us together here to pontificate about. This is borne out by the data. Startup acquisitions are strongly and positively correlated with investment in startups. By contrast, other methods of startup exit, like IPO, don't they don't share that relationship. And I, I, I presume that the, the earlier panel touched on this, and, and I, I imagine Bettina and her remarks will, will touch on this as well. But IPO and startup investment are only weakly associated. So M&A, startup acquisition, startup investment, very strong positive relationship and very important. Two, exits via acquisition are much more accessible for startups than, than IPO and, and other methods of exit. Um, I don't want to press on, in on this fact for exactly as Andrew said, for startups in ecosystems that aren't in the big ones like Silicon Valley or New York, Boston, uh, because of the lack or, or relative lack of, of institutions integral to the IPO process, um, M&A becomes the only important or feasible real method of exit for, for startups there. And those exits are critical to growing those ecosystems. They're critical to the economic growth in the not top hubs so that they can be the, the top hubs of tomorrow. Capital and talent then stay in those ecosystems. The founders that have exited, they don't go leave. They don't go, go live on a yacht in the Mediterranean. Um, often those exit values aren't, aren't big enough to do that. But what they do do is they stay in the ecosystem. They become investors. They help other startups. They become mentors. They open startup open incubators, startup incubators, startup incubators, startup incubators, startup incubators. Startup they become incubators. the anchor for that community. And that too is borne out by the data. The relationship between startup investment and startup acquisitions that I talked about just a bit ago is stronger and more positive in the ecosystems outside of those top ecosystems. So in the smaller, more rural ecosystems, a stronger, more positive relationship, more important. We talked a lot about the role of capital, return on investment. Um, really want to underscore the role of talent here. When a founder sells their startup, they probably join the, the acquiring firm, oversee integration, or maybe uh, stay for even longer. Um, um, maybe, they, maybe they don't. They almost always stay in the startup ecosystem, becoming a, an investor, becoming a mentor, um, starting new companies. Um, we have someone like this that's going to join us on this panel in just a little bit in, in Bettina. Um, at Engine, we work with a, a network of startups across the country. And Cheat, I, I missed the first panel because I was speaking with a startup founder about this, these issues. Um, and, and, and so I just want to offer a few examples here. So let's start with a founder of an AI startup who sold their company to a, a big tech uh, company. Um, we'll, we'll use that term, even though it's pejorative because it's what everybody uses. Um, and they've since left that, that acquiring firm to join a new startup as an executive where they're responsible for the growth of that company. He's taking what he learned, uh, growing his own company, selling his company, and he's growing and doing the same thing again, um, bringing those new innovations to market. How about the founder of a, a tutoring startup sold their company again to a, a big tech company. Almost all, or I'm sorry, all of their almost 100 employees were brought onto the acquiring firm. And this is a great thing for, for reasons Andrew touched on. Some are going to use that experience and, and newfound wealth to, jo to start their own startups, to join other startups, um, or become investors in startups. Final example, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Uh, this founder, they, they have, have sold multiple companies, started and sold multiple companies, including to a big tech company and a, and a large integrated circuit company. Now, this founder is using their knowledge, their experience, their resources they gained from those experiences to build wearable technology specific for seniors, literally helping to save lives. Now, I'm not gonna say that uh, 
you know, acquisitions are, are saving lives. But in this case, they literally enabled the cycles of innovation that led to this life-saving technology. So that's why this is all important. That's why we, we're, we're all here talking to, to everyone about this. Not as, you know, policy folks or startup folks, but as consumers and as people and as individuals, robust M&A is what drives the dynamism of the startup ecosystem and makes the innovations that we all benefit from possible. So that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Of a more relevant, a more space, relevant, space, relevant space than biotech, medical equipment, you know, where small companies will hit that innovation glass ceiling that we talked about and need to partner with Big Pharma or sell to Big Pharma or license to Big Pharma in order for those technologies to come to the marketplace that really do save uh, hundreds, if not tens of thousands of lives. Well, last but most certainly not least, we are joined now by Bettina Hine. She is our last panelist. She is in the trenches every day as founder uh, of, of several entrepreneurial companies. She's given testimony on Capitol Hill. She's written extensively on this topic. We're very blessed to have her with us. Uh, Bettina, I thought if you could give a few minutes uh, about yourself and your companies and then uh, give us your perspective on these issues and then we'll loop you into the conversation because I've been saving a few uh, pretty t uh, interesting topics for your presence. Uh, so I'm really glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me and sorry that I had to be late. I'm on the board of a company and they just had their annual meeting. So I had to attend that and they made it possible that right next to that meeting, I can uh, here join you uh, virtually at least. Um, so I am a lifetime tech entrepreneur. I like to brag that I've never had a real job. So I founded my first software company right out of graduate school. Um, all of my startups have been venture and angel funded. Um, they've all taken large amounts of data, applied AI to them, and uh, then optimized for a certain outcome. I've done that in speech tech. I've done that in <clears throat> advertising technology. And now I'm doing it for digital health and healthcare. Um, what I've learned uh, along the way is to uh, build companies that can scale to help um, to create jobs, which is I see as my primary mission uh, in life. And um, I've learned what it, it takes also to uh, receive investment uh, for a company that um, requires scale. Um, I successfully sold my uh, first company. I got 8 million in investment for that company and sold it then uh, in an M&A transaction to our biggest competitor for $125 million. Um, and uh, that was in part, that was a good exit. I'm not complaining at all, even though I had in the low single digits left of that, that company, but um, it was not our preference uh, to do an M&A uh, transaction. It was our preference as founders that we would have liked to have grown that company more. Um, and what the traditional way in the 80s or 90s would have been for companies like that, when I sort of had this girlhood dream, um, to, it was usual to take companies public, which is what Apple did, what Microsoft did, and companies did that at relatively small scale. Um, what then happened was Sarbanes-Oxley, and that killed uh, the dream for so many uh, of us, uh, of that generation of entrepreneurs, because rather than being able to go public with $40 million um, in revenue, you would have to get at least over 100 and raise an additional $10 million in capital to uh, build a whole finance department and to build a um, uh, just pay for all the consultants and lawyers, et cetera, that are required to do that. Um, what Sarbanes-Oxley was intended for was to um, save the retail investor from being exploited. What it actually did is it, it denied retail investors access to the most valuable big tech companies 
that um, have come up in the last 20 years because those companies stayed private much longer and were financed by um, growth, venture capital, uh, private equity, hedge funds, and they got those returns off the table. So instead of um, trying to keep harm from retail shareholders for investing somewhat unwisely, they kept the largest returns of this century away from, um, from retail investors. Uh, and also I could have probably uh, sold my, uh, my company for uh, a lot more if I ha would have had this alternative route, right? Because m and can always compete. The numbers show this right after um, Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted um, in the next five years, IPOs of small cap companies dropped by 95%. Um, that was not the intention, but it killed a lot of innovation in the United States. It made bigger people richer, right? The, the big capital, and it uh, allowed less reinvestment because what I do with the money that I've earned is I um, provide for my family. Um, uh, which, you know, I, I for a long time was uh, the breadwinner, the sole breadwinner for my family. And um, what I also do with that is I invest again in other startups, right? Um, that was just said, said earlier. I'm, for example, I spend my time right now, I split it because I'm an immigrant entrepreneur as well. I split it between Switzerland and the United States, and I it allowed me to become a judge on the Swiss version of Shark Tank, where I every year deploy capital to help other innovation into the world. And I invest in the in the United States. And I am not I am not a gajillionaire in any form or fashion, right? I just I have enough money that where I can invest in startups and I can send my kids to college. I'm very fortunate in that way, in a self-made way but um, I contribute back to, to my, my, my ecosystem through that. And um, if the proposed mergers and acquisitions uh, legislation goes through, then um, the M&A route, so the IPO route closed, and now you wanna close um, a big part of the uh, M&A route. Like how, how am I going to make money? How am I going how to- so um, I hope that I've made my initial points here and I'm looking forward for those, uh, those most fun questions that you said you would <laughs> pose us. Presence, uh, Presence, uh, you don't mind, uh, you don't we mind. call you for the rest of the program, Ms. Wonderful, right? Now that's a little bit of a Shark Tank joke. You have to be a regular watcher to get it, but uh, I think I'll be calling you Ms. Wonderful now. Um, well, that, that's, that sounds very nice and... Uh, the elephant in the room, if you pulled off 10th and K Street, uh, John Q. Citizen, and you said to John Q. Citizen, uh, what is the purpose of antitrust laws in America? And they would say, it's to protect David against Goliath. I mean, that's, you know, a professor so-called touched on this, but we're going to touch on it now from a different perspective. You know, to protect David against Goliath. And, you know, that is probably the perception of a lion's share of the country. And then you say, why would some of the leading minds in small business and entrepreneurship be against uh, legislation that purports, and I put the word purports in quotes, to protect David's against Goliath? And, and I do want to sort of debunk a myth. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, I've spent my entire life representing small and mid-sized companies uh, many times in negotiations or transactions with large companies. And I think we all agree, the entire panel, and Bettina, I know you've got some views on this coming up, so, so hold on, that big companies are not the enemy. They are not the enemy of small business, and they are not the enemy of the antitrust laws. Um, if we make the consumer the focus, as Professor Sokol gave us, a legislative history, then we have to change almost like in family court, the best interest of the child. And it's not about the husband and it's not about the wife, it's about the child, it's about the consumer. Um, so that's point one, but point two, you know, it was casually mentioned 
uh, in the first panel around corporate venture capital. Well, between corporate venture capital, joint ventures, teaming, supply chain, subcontracting, licensing, incubation, accelerators, we don't even get to M&A before we've got dozens of different ways that small companies and big companies partner and team and interact with each other to the benefit of innovation, to the benefit of consumers. And so the elephant in the room, and Bettina, I want you to start with this, is, you know, from a policy perspective, you know, where is the right balance? I mean, of course, you know, a, a panel of small business owners and entrepreneurs would want to make sure that they can compete freely in a marketplace. But at the surface level, you know, what are the, the particular unintended consequences that are making us all so concerned and making us so aligned in our views with the previous panel? Does that, does that make sense as a question? 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 Um, well, I, I, I want to uh, just say here for the record, big tech companies are in a certain aspect monopolists. They need to be regulated and regulations and law need to have teeth. Um, I have been on the receiving end of monopolistic behavior of big tech companies, and it uh, is uh, something that uh, regulators and lawmakers need to understand in detail. I do not think that restricting M&A is the answer for this. Um, if you uh, restrict that, what they will do just as they are already doing is that they just make instead of buy. If they're going to use what I have to sell or what I came up with, they at least should pay me for it and not just copy it and put it as a feature into their software. And my investors get nothing. My family gets nothing, right? So, so that's, I, I think that is a, pertinent point um it's also it's not it's not about m a right there's a there's a weird cap on valuation to as a proxy for punishing uh big tech i i think this is a, a, a cheap way to score points with the public um with the huge risk of unintended consequences um and the more, the better approach would be to have individual uh, things that are being looked at. And I know this is being done in Congress, for example, access to APIs to data, right? The, it's not about the software that you can build. It is what uh, these tech behemoths have built that nobody else can access. Um, that is one of the difficulties uh, um, um, I'm, I'm just going to mention here the access to um, YouTube advertising inventory um, as, as one example. And um, there are ways to make this better, to allow better products to, for the American consumer, but also not to harm the startup ecosystem that depends on uh, liquidity in the market in order to do new ideas and bring new things to market. You don't, um, you don't, um, you don't level you the don't. playing field by taking away the owner's right to sell the stadium, right? I mean, that, that's, that's not the right approach. Uh, John, Karen, uh, Todd, uh, Nathan, please weigh in here. I mean, uh, help educate John Q consumer or John Q citizen on 10th and K who would think at a surface level that we would be, you know, grand proponents of, of, a, of a piece of legislation like this. Well, I'll just, uh, yeah, uh, Karen here, I'll, um, well, yeah, I, I, I mean, the concern is, you know, under the, you know, because it's fashionable right now to beat up on big tech, <laughs> you know, our, our regulators and, and policymakers and members of Congress um, under the guise of big tech, doing other things, you know, that they've always 
from their political perspective, you know, have always been part of their broader agenda, right? And so, um, so for example, you know, if there are issues on intellectual property, if there are, you know, other types of issues, I mean, we should be using the proper levers and the proper tools and the proper mechanism, you know, to deal with that. So, um, you know, obviously at the Federal Trade Commission, I mean, they do have tools there, you know, there, there is a process there. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's like a lot of what happens in Washington, you know, you know, proposing these big things where they don't understand what the impact will be on the small business sector or the unintended consequences or are using the wrong, you know, vehicles, um, you know, to, to correct an injustice. And I would say, you know, these, if there are problems in the marketplace to solve, that, you know, there has to be a more targeted, small approach, you know, that addresses a specific problem as opposed to, you you know, what you said, having to basically upend an entire system that will really harm uh, entrepreneurs everywhere, you know, innovation and, and, and U.S. competitiveness. I mean, to me, it's crazy that at the same time that Congress is uh, negotiating a competes bill on U.S., you know, to help with U.S. competition, that we're doing other things that will undermine, um, you know, the competitive advantage that we have here uh, in the United States on a number of fronts, um, including um, including M and A, and 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 we are seen as the envy of the world. People come to us. I mean. I know the State Department has sent me everywhere over the past 20 years to talk about everything that we're doing to encourage entrepreneurship and innovation and foreign investment and all that other. And you know, this was a critical piece of that. Um, so anyway, so targeted, using the right tools, a targeted approach as opposed to sort of these big things that just um, will, in essence, uh, you know, wreck the economy and hurt our innovative and, and entrepreneurial spirit. So, Todd, I think you know, as Bettina said, it's not that there aren't um, problems. It's not that uh, abuses don't happen, and there are changes to a regulatory scheme. I think we would support uh, that get at real issues. But then use but, a rifle, not a cannon. Exactly. Right? Um, but restricting, specifically restricting the ability of small companies in an arbitrary way to to, to sell uh, or to merge uh, to you know in a uh, a way that's not at all targeted, but also shifts the burden of proof, as as uh, uh, has been talked about before, in really unfair and difficult ways. Just doesn't support entrepreneurs. So the, the thing I don't understand, you know, I was born in 1961. I turned 60. Not a single one of the companies that are being targeted in this fashionable way existed, right? Karen, when you and I were babies. I mean, they were all startups 20 years ago or 25 years ago, from Microsoft to Facebook to Google to you name it. And they have become the pride of our country. I mean, we are admired around the world for the enterprise value that's been created by many of these companies. And as Bettina said, to the extent that they're acting in an anti-competitive way, well then find a targeted approach. But I think, Nathan, you would agree that if you, if you come across with sweeping legislation, this also applies to Caterpillar that may want to buy a midsize agricultural company you know, in, in the Midwest, but if it's going to be too expensive or they have the burden of proof, they might just pass. And now hundreds of employees at that company uh, do not have an exit path, not just the owners, but the employees that got stock options and other things. Nathan, what, what are your thoughts there? Sure. So uh, uh, I encourage folks to, to go to Engine's website and, and read some of the, the profiles we do weekly of startups. And, and we talked to, to Startups Weekly and, and, and about the policy issues, specifically the policy issues they face. So the folks from, you know, from uh, rural Nebraska to, to Silicon Valley to, to other parts of the country. And we asked them, you know, what's going on in your ecosystem? What are the, the policy issues that, that, that you're facing? And uh, no one, no one has ever said explicitly, oh, antitrust, or oh, you know, we really wish uh, Google couldn't buy us. Um, no one says that because it, it's not true. 
what they do tell us is they say, you know, uh, we can't expand into California because there's a really onerous uh, privacy regime there. We need a federal privacy standard so that we don't have to go state by state and spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars to figure this stuff out. Uh, we need better access to capital. We need uh, support uh, in, in, uh, in institutions in our communities to help us do these things. Um, we need to, to not be opened up to, to frivolous lawsuits for, for, you know, uh, for patent trolling or uh, uh, inter other inter intermediary liability issues. Um, and so these are the, the things that folks talk about. These are the, the principal barriers. Um, and so when we're solving for competition issues, for startups, all policy is competition policy. If you can't get off the ground, if you can't, uh, you know, spend your startup resources, uh, you know, the average seed stage startup, this is already, you're talking about the, already the most uh, privileged startup with, with institutional uh, investor backing. They only are operating with around $50,000 a month and they have to do all of their uh, necessary startup activities. They have to pay salaries for, for engineers and, and for contractors to develop their business. They have to do the marketing function to, to uh, acquire customers uh, and users. And so uh, there really isn't room for all these extra, uh, extra expenses from, from, from other regulatory issues. And there certainly isn't room for um, the kind of downstream impact on their ability to get investment um, if their investors don't think they're going to be able to get a return, if they don't think they're going to be able to sell down the line or have that open area. So um, it's all competition policy, and you can't uh, solve all these issues with uh, whacking, uh, you know, using the antitrust hammer to, to whack the antitrust now. Nathan, your point reminds me of something I, I wanted to also share. Many transactions recently are not even sellers voluntarily selling their business. Uh, we just closed a deal a few weeks ago that was the consolidation of two local dealerships that were being urged to merge uh, by the manufacturer who wanted to streamline their uh, distribution channels. And so even if they really didn't want to sell, they were selling um, because there were third-party pressures, whether from investors or manufacturers or uh, uh, could be key suppliers, um, we're going to see more consolidation, particularly with the supply chain risks that we have and other economic variables where, you know, parties are going to have to do transactions, m and transactions, frankly, whether they want to or not, and adding to the cost and burdens of those transactions is not really helping anybody. Um, so, Bettina, John made a fantastic point what, before you join, and John, I've been waiting to come back to this point. And I want to get, John, I want you to reinforce the point and then Bettina comment and then the rest of the panel. John said, look, we have to understand that many small business owners and entrepreneurs are not, you know, there was a great book written in the 1960s, Garen and Todd remember this, a small business is not a small big business, right? You remember that book, right? A, a, a small business is not a little big business. It's a great book title. You don't have to read the book, you just have to know the title. And it's true. Many of our small business owners were not wired to run $200 million or $2 billion companies. And they get to a certain growth place where they need to exit in order to protect the enterprise value and the employees and the ecosystems of their business. Um, and, you know, Professor Sokol made reference to serial entrepreneurs. I just want to clarify for the audience that's not Frosted Flakes and Cheerios. That's the other cereal. Since he had the, the tacos thing going, I'll, I'll stay in cereal mode. But the, the point being that um, we can't overly restrict the pathways to M&A because to do so misunderstands the true nature of many of America's small business owners who are very happy. And John, I want you to talk about this for a second and Bettina reinforce, they're very happy building businesses up to a certain point and then are relying on selling them so they can go on to the next one and the next one and the next one. Uh, so John, I was setting it up for you and I hope I didn't um, cannibalize your point. 
able to hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. I, I, I shifted off of a computer and put on a headset at the request of the organizers to try to cut down on the echo uh, here in the basement of my house. So I just wanted to check. Uh, no, I think uh, I, I'm gonna uh, pitch it to Bettina very quickly because I think that she can speak to this with an authenticity that is is really uh, unique because she is a three-time entrepreneur can speak to that dynamic. Um, uh, but it is, uh, it is very true. As I said earlier, uh, many entrepreneurs regard themselves as founders and as establishers in the first few years of a company's development. That's what they enjoy. And they like to do it over and over and over again. They're not interested in building a company over 20 or 30 years. They're founders and they're establishers. And so it's a perfectly appropriate and relevant aspect of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. They're very important entrepreneurs in our system. Uh, and the other thing that I would just underscore again is that, uh, and Bettina spoke to this as well, that the reason why, and, and one thing, one statistic I haven't heard yet, um, uh, although it, it, it's been implied in terms of the emphasis of the importance of acquisition as a, as a pathway to exit, there are 10 times as many acquisitions every year as there are IPOs. Uh, that just goes to show you the importance of acquisitions, but it also goes to show you that there is a, a, a large reason why the number of acquisitions is so much larger than IPOs. And that is uh, because Congress created an enormous hurdle for small companies uh, 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 less developed companies to go public uh, uh, simply because they can't afford to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley. And we have one on our panel, and that's Bettina Hine. Uh, Bettina, I, I believe, and she can speak to this, uh, took the pathway of selling her first company in large part because she couldn't afford to go public, even though it was, as she has put, uh, uh, put it in her testimony on December 15th uh, before the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, it was her girlhood dream to run a publicly traded company, but she couldn't because she couldn't comply with the requirements. She, she couldn't afford the requirements of going public, and so she sold that company. So uh, for both of the reasons, the large hurdle that Congress created and is now trying to clean up its own mess with the Platform Competition and Opportunity Act, but, um, that's one uh, major reason for the, 10, the 10x factor of acquisitions over IPOs. But then also, it is a perfectly reasonable and legitimate aspect uh, of the entrepreneurial ecosystem for there to be this turnover, this flywheel effect whereby new companies are sold to larger companies to scale their innovation, for capital to be reclaimed, for entrepreneurs to be able to monetize their, uh, their innovation and move on. Thanks, John, for kicking that over to me. Um, absolutely, uh, you're right. I had mentioned earlier that we as founders would have loved to scale uh, our first company uh, more, but it was there were just not the resources available for that. Um, there are different reasons why people love to do the early stage, and there are different reasons why people want uh, to sell. One of the reasons that um, that exists why companies often need to be sold, and I don't know if that has been mentioned here, is uh, the 10 year cycle that venture capital funds run on. So um, at a certain point, investors, because this is the vehicle they're investing through, need uh, to go out. And uh, that's another reason why this system has to, has to work um, because otherwise those funds can't be reinvested. Um, also, yes, there are many entrepreneurs that really enjoy uh, at the early stage. Um, but others also see that um, they can't scale unless they become part of a larger company. And uh, I have many friends that have sold their companies to bigger entities to then see what really great things can be done once you have even more resources at your disposal. And, and they are thrilled about what has become uh, of their products. And they have, you know, within Salesforce or Adobe been able to build larger business units and thereby increase the number of jobs uh, that are associated with what they have built. Um, so, you know, I think that there, there are just 
people that love to get things going, give it to other people. Some people that want to grow more, but are just restricted by timelines of funds or capital markets. So, um, so companies, acquirers have a, a, a real role there in, in making things happen. Uh, one thing that I wanted to, to mention, and I don't know if that's on your agenda, Andrew, <laughs> or not, um, but is that um, every time you make these new regulations, big companies find a way to profit from that. And lawyers and consultants. I'm really sorry. I know everybody has to make a living, <laughs> but... Um, what I see when I hear, you know, as an entrepreneur about these new regulations um, uh, and legislation that's proposed, I think, okay, um, this is counterintuitively going to make big tech more successful because they're the ones that can afford the lawyers, that can afford the consultants, and that cost will be passed on to me because they are the only ones that can really afford that and therefore push uh, the price of my company that I've created even further down and is acts quasi as a tax on my entrepreneurial labor and the rich will continue to get richer, um, which I know is not a, something that uh, you know conservatives like to hear, but um, I am not one, even though I am <laughs> against <laughs> new antitrust in this case. Um, it just really watch out what you're doing. You're going to you're going to make the opposite happen of what you're intending more often than not. Karen, 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 Karen. To Bettina's Karen. point, I mean, our small business survey that uh, we released last week, we asked a lot on the economy and, and policy, and specifically we asked about, you know, the antitrust um, legislation or antitrust uh, proposals being considered. And you know, we asked the business owners, what is the biggest concern that you have in terms of the competitiveness of your business? The number one response is that it's going to benefit larger, benefit, larger businesses and the established players in the market. So you know, this is where policymakers, legislators, they need to listen to small business because they will tell them exactly what the result will be. Yeah. You know, um Karen's point and Bettina's point remind me of uh, a disturbing trend that we haven't talked about yet, and I don't think it's been talked about since 8.30 this morning, and that is, what about mid-sized businesses? You know, in the D.C. area, uh, there's a lot of government contractors. Um, many, a lot of the M&A is by and among government contractors. There are many mid-sized government contractors who always feel like every time they bid on a small business to buy, they're going to be outbid by a bigger contractor, and they never have the highest bid because they're, you know, just a $500 million company or just a billion dollar company. And I know you're not getting out your big violins for a company that's 500 million in sales, but when they have to bid in the M&A world against a $50 billion or $100 billion company over and over and over again, uh, Bettina's point and Karen's point is spot on, and that is, who do you think is going to win that bidding war? And how does that mid-sized company that's sort of stuck, you know, if you're if you're a poker player, we call that a tweener hand. You know, you're you're too big to be small and too small to be big. And yet America's middle-sized companies have a say in all of this as well. And and many of uh, the bigger companies that are under attack were once middle-sized companies. So we've really got to think through one of the themes you've heard since first thing this morning is unintended consequences and and the message of making sure that Congress uh, knows the consequences and that the regulators know the consequences, um, which in this case we have a very zealous regulator at the helm of the FTC. Um, uh, the consequences not just to big business, but also to mid-sized business, but also to small business and to entrepreneurial companies that are looking to preserve their pathway to exit and as the theme of today, you know, making sure that the innovation ecosystem remains re robust, not just so that we can have job creation and wealth creation, but also so that we can stay competitively 
uh, stay competitive globally um, because you know that that we're certainly living in a geopolitical world where that that needs to be very very relevant. Um, I think we're we've got a little bit of time left, or how are we doing on on time, conference organizers? Twenty minutes. Okay, uh, good. We've got a couple more uh, issues that we can we can address. Um, so, from a policy perspective, are there some alternatives that can be looked at? Is there anything, um, you know, Karen? I'm thinking about the Defense of Trade Secrets Act from a couple years ago. Are there some examples that you or Todd or John in particular could look at over the last even 10 years that are more balanced legislation where Congress really did find you know, the right uh, balance in protecting the interests of small business and maybe uh, that message can be taken back? You know, what, what legislation truly protects the interests of small business uh, that could be more of a model benchmark than what's being proposed now? Any examples come to mind? Well, I would say the one you point out is one, and I, I'm not sure I would point out to another, more examples of where Congress got things right, at least other things <laughs> they could do. Uh, and, and that is one of the, our concerns in this whole area, because we're, we're, we're talking about innovation and the, the ability of small companies to, to, to capitalize on their own innovations, essentially is what this comes down to. And that is the patent reform bill we passed a number of years ago, uh, we've always had deep concerns about it, took right. our patent system, we believe, in the wrong direction, made it harder for small inventors, made it harder for small companies to defend their patents. Um, and I think going back to something like that, that would give a lot more uh, ability of small companies to, um, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to exist in the marketplace and, and hold their own against larger competitors would, would, would be one place to start. Todd, I think that's a great point. I mean, if you almost, if you took this entire issue and turned it on its head and, and made it backwards in a diagram, and you started with the innovation ecosystem, right. and you said, look, if, the, if, if we agree that the antitrust laws are there in part to protect the consumer and to protect innovation, then let's look at things like the amendments to the patent laws or the trade secret laws that were there to protect the innovation ecosystem and then work our way backwards analytically and from a policy perspective and we might come to a much better conclusion yeah, instead of starting with some political agenda or a particularly you know targeted set of big tech companies that we want to attack and then working our way around the legislation and you know Karen you and I have had this conversation over a couple glasses of wine from time to time I mean why can't we begin right with what's best for the ecosystem. That's right. And then work our way backwards instead of coming up with these policies and then realizing, oh my gosh, five years later, the ecosystem just got damaged. Yeah, I mean, there is just so much tumult in the economy right now and so many things that need to be fixed, right? Supply chains, I mean, obviously, you know, we need new business creation. Um, uh, there's, you know, labor issues. There's a whole host of things that uh, again, uh, and I think this has been reinforced, you know, by other panelists, is that, you know, there's a whole host of things that Congress can be focusing on that can really right. help, you know, the startup uh, ecosystem and, and small businesses uh, at this point in time, including, if you will, when you talk about, well, is there balanced bipartisan approaches, including on the whole issue of access to capital. You know, there's um, the... Um, you know, a lot of the bipartisan bills that have been passed by the House, either by voice vote or, you know, in large, you know, bipartisan numbers, um, a lot of those bills didn't move forward over on the Senate side. So I think there's, an, you know, there's so much that needs to be done to strengthen uh, the ecosystem. And even by Congress's own admission, I mean, there's a competition problem. Obviously, there's some issues with China. And, but why are we doing things that are going to make us less competitive, you know, Precisely. less innovative, and then we'll have to fix this problem with something else, right? So, um, but look, at we're all for, there's a lot of, I think, consensus on issues, right, where we need improvement in our economy and improvement of the ecosystem. 
right now, during this very difficult and challenging period of time for our economy, that's where it would be great for Congress and the, and the White House to be focusing on, I instead mean, they, of these other right. risky things that are going to harm, harm the ecosystem. And, and, you know, we haven't really dug into how is a small, privately owned business valued at the end of the day. The capital market's volatility does not help a company's right. valuation one bit. You know, when you look at multiples of EBITDA, which we can get into another time, you know, the multiples are already brought down by market volatility. If you add higher transactional costs and a lack of clear exits, you're going to bring these multiples down to a point where it's, you know, some business owners are going to say, why bother? You know, why should I bother? If I can't get liquid, I may as well just close the doors of the company. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to really see unemployment, you know, we have record lows now, but that could turn quickly. We're already seeing, you know, all these additional signs of layoffs and things, and you know that that could turn on a dime. No, I was going to say maybe you know John or Nathan. Yeah, I was going yeah, to ask other if John wanted to weigh in or, or solutions Nathan. Yes. for us today. Yes, <laughs> please. Two quick points that I would make. One is uh, is on your point or your question, Andrew, about alternatives to legislation. The other one is on Karen's point uh, regarding uh, the vulnerability of the economy right now, which I think is an excellent, excellent point and plays to the uh, uh, concern that we all have about unintended consequences and the impact of those unintended consequences. We all know uh, how important these large uh, digital platforms that are being targeted in this legislation are uh, to American entrepreneurship. Uh, they have been uh, great facilitators uh, of American entrepreneurship, have brought the cost of launching and growing a business down dramatically uh, in, in recent years. One of the things uh, uh, that from with entrepreneur uh, is, is all of them uh, uh, reciting in unison how important uh, the digital platforms are uh, 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 to their ability to start and grow their businesses, the reduction of cost in terms of data computation and data storage, uh, the ability to reach consumers, the ability to reach investors, uh, th this packaging of digital tools that the large digital platforms uh, provide immensely valuable to uh, startups. Karen and others have mentioned uh, the increased number of, uh, of new business applications and how encouraging that is. A very large portion of those new businesses uh, that are being launched are being launched on on the digital platforms, uh, on Amazon, on Google, uh, on on, uh, uh, on Apple, um, and moreover, we know from from uh, the impact of the pandemic. You know, this trend toward the digitalization of new and small businesses has been underway for years, but we know that the pandemic dramatically accelerated it because of of the restrictions on social distancing and being able to interact in a brick and mortar context with customers, investors, uh, et cetera. That uh, new and small businesses turned increasingly to digital storefronts and digital tools. And so the penetration, the importance uh, of, of digital tools and platforms for new and small businesses has been uh, accelerated by a decade, making the risk of unintended consequences of, of, of tearing this whole system apart or turning it on its head, uh, the risk of really profound and very destructive unintended consequences has gone up dramatically. Uh, so I wanted to make that point, you know, at, at a time when, when our economy is very vulnerable and very fragile and policymakers ought to be doing everything that they can to reinforce and strengthen the economic, the post-COVID economic recovery, this is not something that, that uh, policymakers ought to be focused on in my judgment um, and, and in the judgment of the entrepreneurs that we've talked to. By way of alternatives, I think it's important to point out that we have regulators uh, and the regulators are there for a reason. I would also point out uh, that when the regulators have decided to take a merger to court uh, and object to a merger over the last 25 years, they have a success rate of blocking mergers north of 85%. Uh, so when the regulators act, they are very effective. Now, if somebody is of the view that they're not uh, doing it enough, well, then that, that's a resource question. Um, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, regulators, the, the posture of regulators to enforce current antitrust, antitrust restrictions ought to be uh, augmented. But as one uh, uh, entrepreneur at our roundtable put it, and this is, it's funny because you, you used, Andrew, an analogy, you know, we need a, a rifle and a cannon. 
uh, the entrepreneur at our roundtable said, we don't need the sledgehammer of legislation. We need a surgeon's scalpel to carefully dissect and, and understand the details and nuances of every proposed acquisition, all of which are different. And that surgeon's scalpel resides at the regulators. It's not in legislation. Um, now that all depends, you know, it's very important to have the right folks in the regulatory positions. You made the point earlier that we have somebody who's very zealous in charge of the FTC now, but as a general matter, the alternative to, uh, uh, to legislation that risks very damaging unintended consequences is to let the regulators do their job. Uh, Nathan, uh, Bettina, Nathan, anything Bettina? on that one point? And then I, I wanna get to another topic that we need to drive home before we close. So quickly then, uh, you asked about other legislation that, that's helpful for entrepreneurs, and, and I feel like uh, maybe we can't avoid touching on the Jobs Act. Um, you know, folks, I think we're on Jobs Act 4.0 now um, that folks are working on. And uh, as part of that, uh, earlier, or earlier this month or maybe late last month, we were talking to startups about this all across the country. And, and someone says, I see this is really uh, focused on the public market. What about M&A? Well, um, we're actually in, in M&A going in the wrong direction in terms of its proposed uh, legislation. And so we we'll just uh, come to that, that very brief conclusion that uh, entrepreneurs want M&A to, to be helped along, not uh, in inhibited, uh, and, and that they, they think about it when they think about exits and, and other legislation aimed at, at helping them exit. Bettina, 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 Bettina. Um, I, I don't, I'm not right now thinking about additional legislation, but I'm thinking about what, um, uh, what really needs to be done in terms of anti-competitiveness. Um, and I know this, I may not be completely popular here with people in the room or on the panel, but I do think that European regulators um, do a much better job in some respects uh, in reigning in monopoly power. And I'll give a, a telecom example here, um, which is what is the cost of internet access in the United States versus Europe? It's, we have much faster uh, internet access here and, and a lot less expensive uh, in Europe because of a better regulation. Um, we also, another telecom example is that um, in Europe with its many, many countries, um, telecoms were imposing terrible roaming fees on anybody that drove between Belgium and France or Germany and Austria or wherever. Um, and this was the surgical thing that got fixed by the regulators. It was harming consumers. It was clearly anti-competitive behavior. And um, I think resources should be invested in those things. As I mentioned on a small business level earlier, that's access to data, or um, that is data privacy, which still is not regulated well in, in the United States. And um, where Europeans are actually have um, competitive advantages now, European startups, because they've already taken um, a more stringent pi privacy regulations into account. So I think there are other places where the FTC and other regulators could put uh, their energies rather than restricting m a Well, I think Professor Sokol was advocating the Antitrust laws in China, so you're definitely not, you're definitely not, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, as right? unpopular. Okay. Yes, um, I want to. I think we're coming up near the end, so I just want to maybe hit one more topic, unless there's a question from the audience. It's a topic that's been touched on, uh, little bits and pieces throughout throughout the program, but it's a topic that I feel very strongly about, and I think we need to reinforce. I'm afraid that again, John Q. Citizen is thinking. Who cares about some small business owner that's going to sell out for $100 million and become wealthy and sit around at a country club in, in Tampa, Florida, and play golf? You know, that misperception 
of what happens when an owner sells their business is severely misguided. Um, we, you know, in, in, the, in the years I've been doing this, the, the, the cashed out entrepreneurs that have either started new businesses, which we've talked about serial entrepreneurship, that have become incredible philanthropists and members of their community that have joined academia and become wonderful professors and mentors and coaches. We in the United States have an incredible track record of mentoring and coaching and giving back. I believe that our charitable contributions are tenfold the amount of the country that comes in second. I don't have the latest data point on top of me, but I think it was around that amount. Where do you think that wealth comes from? If we cut off the path to M&A, we are putting philanthropy and charitable giving at risk. We're putting our academic institutions and some of the finest adjunct and full-time professors at risk. Um, I want to debunk the myth that people just sit around in their mansions and play golf, and that's what happens when businesses are sold. Uh, the data says otherwise, particularly as entrepreneurs are getting younger and younger, and they're selling out in their 30s or 40s, and they have another 20, 30, 40 years of life ahead of them, and they want to be productive, and they want to give back. I don't even want to imagine uh, what medical advances and, and social advances would not be possible without the help of the Gates Foundation or other foundations that uh, have been created by some of the most successful entrepreneurs in this country. Uh, and that wealth was created either through M&A uh, or in some cases going public. So I'd like to hear from our panel about, you know, what does, what, since our theme today has been unintended consequences, what could the unintended consequences be to our society if these laws go too far and create too many speed bumps on the pathway or highway of M&A when we look at how productive entrepreneurs and small business owners have been on a post-closing basis? Well, I, I, Andrew, that's all the things that you say, plus the fact that a very significant number of these acquisitions are, are by, as we've talked about before, serial entrepreneurs, right? So these people tend to sell their business and they'll reinvest in a new business that creates more jobs, that creates more innovations, that creates more productivity for the economy. If, that, if they, don't, they can't sell the first business, they're not going to create the second and the third and the fourth. Uh, so uh, the, the ripple effects are, are tremendous. Um, and, and, and they won't attract capital and they won't attract talent. Exactly. Remember, so, with record low unemployment rates and a war for talent, right. the biggest asset that many small companies have is stock options or opportunities right. for ownership or alternatives to stock options like phantom stock and those are all taken away if there's never going to be an exit it, it, they'll become even more phantom than phantom they'll exactly. become illusory that's right so sorry karen uh, look the same thing i mean obviously as an organization and as a person who cares deeply about our startup ecosystem you know just you know the impact the the just um, the negative impact that this would have on our startup ecosystem, the incentives for starting and growing a business, and then by extension, of, you know what that will have for innovation, uh, you know, in this country and for consumers just benefiting from the miracle of many types of innovations, whether it's in you know big tech or whether it's in you know pharmaceuticals or um, energy, uh, etc. I'm very concerned about you know innovation and, and U.S. competitiveness, but also you know one other thing. I, we we have a lot of members at SBE Council who have sold businesses, multiple businesses, who are very very successful, and this goes back to the points that we we're making at the at the beginning of the session is they're back in their hometowns now. They're rebuilding main streets. They're redeveloping dilapidated you know, main streets and making 100%. these hubs livable again, where people want to go again. I mean, they're providing hope um, and economic growth Look to many Detroit. of these local at, communities. Yeah. Well, there's big Detroit, but there's also little Bellefontaine, you know, Ohio. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different um, uh, local communities and local economies you know, who benefit you know, from this activity, either the, the, the entrepreneur giving back or the entrepreneur reinvesting exactly. um, and, and giving back in that way, so. Let's, uh, John, uh, Nathan, and Bettina. 
Uh, well, very quickly, I'll go back to where um, uh, we started at the beginning of the round table uh, in terms of the importance of startups, startups uh, just generally, startups, generally, 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 the two most important most metrics, if you will, of economic metrics, growth being of any country, any country uh, are economic uh, growth, the pace of economic growth and job creation. Um, those are the two real uh, measures of economic vitality and strength and well-being. Uh, and and uh, research, we, we know from uh, research over the last uh, 10 or 15 years or so uh, that, that startups are immensely important uh, uh, to those two economic uh, metrics. We know from the great work of Robert Solow, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for this insight in 1987, uh, that economic growth is driven by gains in productivity, driven by innovation. That is the is the E equals MC squared, if you will, of economic growth. We also know that the innovation that drives those gains of productivity, which drives economic growth, comes disproportionately, not only, but disproportionately from startups. Startups are the real engine of innovation and economic growth. Not coincidentally, uh, research has shown that startups uh, account for virtually all net new job creation. Existing firms, existing businesses do create jobs, but they also shed jobs as they get better at what they do, as they focus on what they're best at, as they incorporate capital and technology. And in aggregate, if you look at if if you look look at businesses older than five years old, in aggregate, existing firms older than five years old shed an average of about a million jobs a year. Another way of saying that is, were it not for new businesses, the job space in this country would shrink by about a million jobs a year. So from the standpoint of innovation, economic growth, and job creation, another word for all of those things is opportunity and prosperity. Startups are immensely important, and that is what is at stake here if we get this wrong. Uh, Nathan, uh, final word, and then we'll, Bettina, you'll wrap us up. Yeah, Bettina, John, others have talked about the, the consequences of Sarbanes-Oxley uh, for exits via IPO. Um, and and obviously no one then or now is in, in favor of counting fraud. I'm married to account and I'm not going to, to advocate for, for accounting fraud. But I will say folks at that time, um, it, you know, Jeff Flake, for example, went on one of the Sunday shows and I'll confess to not watching this in person. I won't tell you how old I was or wasn't. Uh, then um, went on the Sunday show and said, we're going to cut off access to the public markets, access to the capital markets for our small businesses. And those warnings were, you know, at best ignored. Uh, Senators Bond, Graham, others went on the Senate floor, said the same thing. Um, and and Sarbanes Oxley overwhel overwhelmingly passed um, because this was the, the solution put forward and, and we needed to apparently act very quickly. Um, today we have a group of people that if we do the same thing with M&A, we're going to have similar drastic consequences for the innovation ecosystem. So the, the title of the panel is, is the innovation ecosystem at risk. And the answer is, yeah, if we're not careful. So just put very clearly for entrepreneurs like me, Immigrant entrepreneurs like me, it's about a shot at the American dream. That's why we come to the U.S. This is why we, uh, you know, aspire uh, to to come to the United States is because of the possibility and the let's say not completely unrealistic possibility that you can make it. And uh, the harder we make that through regulation. Uh, the less attractive we will become for that entrepreneurial talent that the United States has dependent, depended upon since its founding. Thank you. Well, first, you. I well, want to thank I Concurrences want... for hosting us today and uh, check out their website for upcoming events. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Second, I got here around 930 at the start of the first panel and Ray Keating and the first panel did such a great job that I was sitting over in the corner going, I don't know how I'm going to be able to follow that panel. So I just want to thank John, Bettina, Karen, Nathan, and Todd for helping bail me out as moderator and making sure that 
I think we, uh, we, we, we did our job and, and we, we, we came in strong. And I hope all of you online and all of you that are here in the audience uh, enjoyed uh, today's program and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much for being part of it.